In his youth, he used to hang out smoking grass at Ganja Park in Kolkata, where Mamta Banerjee would ask him to write speeches for her. Three of his great grandfathers had colleges named after them, while the fourth was a river pirate who had quote unquote access to a decent landing ghat in Silhet. He was a chess prodigy who travelled through Eastern Europe playing chess in the 1980s, and in this episode, he describes his intellectual awakening as well as his sexual awakening. He has been a shippy, he has been a journalist, he has been an editor, he has been an investor, and we. We shall also investigate the legend that he has been in jail in 13 countries and has played chess naked with Tukman Bashi. In this episode, we talk about how Pornhub versus OnlyFans is basically old economy versus new economy. We speak of Bengalis who make bombs, Gujaratis who make fetish costumes for a world market, and what he describes as a burial of the Brahmo within him. This is a fun episode. Are you ready? Welcome to the seen and the unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to the seen and the unseen. My guest today is a remarkable Devangshu Datta. Devangshu and his wife Nilanjana Roy, who's also been on the show, are not just old friends; they're like family to me. They've always treated me with so much kindness. And Nila won't mind my revelation that for many of us friends, it is Devangshu or Didi, as we call him, who we are besotted by. This is a man so well travelled with such colourful adventures that his friends have often referred to him as Flash Man. I often speak of how most of us have deep knowledge of just one or two things. Didi is a polymath with deep knowledge of many things at one point he used to write four columns a week for business standard at least four one was in chess one was in investing one was in economics in general another on current affairs they were all brilliant i've done some early episodes of the show with him back in the day when they were 20 minutes long or so and i've been waiting for ages to do a long leisurely life in times episode with devangshu here it is we talk india politics military history chess sex pornography investing and lots more i love this conversation so much so will you listen in hey the music started and this sounds like a commercial but it isn't it's a plea from me to check out my latest labor of love a youtube show i am co-hosting with my good friend the brilliant ajay shah we've called it everything is everything every week we'll speak for about an hour on things we care about from the profound to the profane from the exalted to the everyday we range widely across subjects and we bring multiple frames with which we try to understand the world please join us on our journey and please support us by subscribing to our youtube channel at youtube.com/amitwarma a m i t v a r m a the show is called everything is everything please do check it out Didi, welcome to the scene and the unseen. Hi, nice being here. Finally got you back. I've had you for an earlier episode once upon a time, but that was back when the show was much shorter. And it's good to have you back again. And I'll start off by asking you what may not perhaps be a cheery question, but something that I think about more and more. That you know, you've you've lived in a long and eventful life. been through men been in many countries had many kinds of experiences and you've also been you know remarkably progressive for your times also you've got a background which we'll no longer talk about of your uh, family being part of the brahmo samaj and all that etc etc when you from from a vantage point of this current moment in time in 2023 when you kind of look back on how this country has changed through these decades and what uh, on maybe how you have changed through these decades in terms of optimism pessimism hope despair you know what's what's your overall vibe these days how do you feel well i think the last 10 years have been terrible in the in terms of both <clears throat> ramping up of extremism and uh, lost economic and socio economic opportunities along that period since you mentioned other countries i'd say that in my experience what little i've seen places go through cycles but um, we've genuinely had India has genuinely had a problem where people with the most regressive social mindsets and complete lack of economic empathy for want of a better word have ended up in power over a long 
period of time. So at one level, they have actively pushed for social and liberal values to revert to a mythical 3rd century AD which did not actually happen. And at another level, they have pushed to reset the regulatory regime back to the 1950s and 60s where you had enormous discretionary power for bureaucrats and ministers and they could make huge sums of money while uh, mm, giving their preferred crony businessmen a good ride. As a result, uh, I'd just call it a huge lost opportunity. You have you have the much talked about demographic dividend, but you haven't educated the demographic dividend. You haven't given them jobs. And I would say the one thing that unites most Indians under 25 is the desire to emigrate. So no, I'm not particularly optimistic at the moment. At one point in time on your Twitter, I think when I first knew you and when you first opened your Twitter account, on your bio, you jokingly said proud right-winger or whatever. The term right-wing was part of that, which you no longer have. And I'm guessing you no longer have that because, of course, what you meant was economic right-winger, someone who's for uh, free markets and that kind of freedom, extending personal freedom to every domain and uh, not keeping it out of the market. And, of course, you and I are in the same boat there. And the, the point is, unfortunately, the only kind of right-wing that exists in India today is the toxic social right-wing. You know, I think yes. both of us would have described ourselves back then as, uh, right when it came to economics, left when it came to society, because we both value individual freedom in every way. And unfortunately, more and more as I look at, you know, Indian politics and Indian society, it strikes me that Indian society has always been conservative and illiberal, even if aspects of it in the lively reality are liberal, as you see in our cuisine and our dresses and all that, which are all beautiful kitcheries. But otherwise, you know, as Akshay Mukul shows in his book on the Gita Press, we've had these illiberal strains in our society and in our politics for decades now and equally you know there's no party that has really been economically right wing we had our glorious 20 years from 91 onwards which lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty with those partial reforms but otherwise all our parties have been statist or left wing in terms of economics and you know conservative and sort of right wing when it comes to social issues which is why you know arun shuri's formulation of nda being upa plus cow holds so true and my question to you is that number one was it a surprise to you at any point that our society was like this because growing up in an elite English speaking liberal bubble as I did, I always assumed that our default was that we are secular and tolerant. And it is only now that I realized that, hey, we were in a bubble of our own and the country wasn't like that. And today, in a sense, politics has caught up with society. So what what has been your sense of that? Or, or were you always aware that, um, you know? I think I was always fairly aware of the fact that you had very militant strains of extremism, both right and left wing. While I grew up in a liberal educated household, I was about five years old when my father's boss was, mar was murdered in broad daylight. And by the time I was 10 years old, I'd seen maybe 15 people being killed on the streets which is uh, which was a common enough experience for i'm talking about calcutta and west bengal in the 1960s and then about manipur in the 1970s so which was a common enough experience but if you grow up in that particular bubble then i don't think you have any illusions about uh, extremism and extremism feeding into politics uh, and of course we've always had you know, reformers like going back to the 1850s or so, Ramon Roy and Vidya Sagar, etc., the great reformers who helped push through things like abolition of sati and widow remarriage, faced huge 
social barriers on opprobrium the people who are now trying to put, push together put together coalitions and push LD, lgbtq rights including the right to get married etc are facing huge social backlash and that part of it doesn't surprise me what does surprise me is that you had that 50 year window when it was not considered all right to go beyond dog whistling in terms of public politics actually going out and triggering a communal riot in order to win votes wasn't considered normal and you didn't have a culture where it was considered okay for an unemployed youth to go out and f- find some poor chap from another community who he could lynch moon to the point where said youth would then be garlanded by a minister for carrying out a lynching so um, that way yes i mean i'm not surprised but it makes me feel deeply unhappy because these are things that you hope eventually that any nation will rise beyond them but obviously we haven't and we seem to have regressed in a lot of ways i i mean to take the lgbtq example one of the things that they want is for this whole 30 day wait period if you're getting married by special license to be pushed out and which is actually something which in practical terms makes a lot of sense because what is done is uh, your picture your picture and that of your putative spouse are put up in a public place and people are asked is there any reason for anyone to object and of course objections have happened because of community because of caste forget about because of gender and uh, that again is a phenomenon that just simply did not occur to even 10 12 years ago i i'm a bengali i come from west bengal of course but Uh, i went to my school batch out of 180 people about 25 were muslim and another 25 since i went to a missionary school were christians and uh, we went to each other's birthdays we played hockey and cricket and football together we hung around a lot in each other's houses as friends and now i see people from that particular batch in whatsapp groups saying things like you know i hate muslims i hate christians when you grew up in a bunch where 20 of your 20 people whose birthdays you went to came from a certain community it takes the some of my best friends are muslims argument a little further i simply cannot understand how you can you know stand up and have these attitudes when you are intimately aware that whatever nar- narrative bullshit you're feeding the world is your lived experience tells you that that narrative is wrong that um, so yeah i mean i i feel very unhappy about these things but then what can one do it it is i suppose part of a phase where this country grows up or maybe ends up being a failure i don't know so a couple of questions i mean the same question really in asked in different ways one is that you know i often think about the difference between the abstract and the concrete that in the abstract we will let you know notions like nationalism and purity and race and blah 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 kind of drive us apart and they can be the source of much hatred but in the concrete you will find people often behaving in a different way and people who are otherwise bigots on twitter being perfectly friendly when you meet them in person and a classic example of this is perhaps what you described that many of the people that you're describing fulminate against the other and against all the damage that aurangzeb did blah 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 and therefore who fulminate against muslims today 
actually had and perhaps have you know muslim friends with whom they behave differently and this is a weird kind of disconnect and it raises a question that why the need for this abstract narrative you know that these narratives the i mean i understand that we are instinctively geared towards tribalism and for in in politics you always need an other so for a politician i understand why the, these are attractive narratives but why do common people you know who are just like you and me in every way why do they feel the need to give in to this narrative of othering and my related question is that you know you mentioned that there was a time where politicians would simply dog whistle but today they just go out and say what they have to say and uh, my theory for this is really it's a it's, it's a concept it's a frame uh, introduced to me by timur quran who wrote this great book uh, private truths public lies and it's it's a concept of preference falsification so i have often suspected that um, uh, th there are many closet bigots who could not openly say things like muslim should not be in india or a woman's places in the kitchen or whatever nonsense they believed but suddenly they realize that that kind of bigotry is not just widespread the majority seems to hold that view they this emboldens and this leads to leads to what timur quran coins a preference cascade and my sort of related question to the earlier one of a why do we need these narratives of like why are these narratives of othering and these anti muslim narratives for example so attractive to so many people and two is it that something has changed today in people or were they always like this and this was just a part of them waiting to find expression I will now have to break Godwin's rule, but I'll add a rider to this. Godwin's rule plus uh, the Eastern Europe. What is the Warsaw Pact countries? We are talking about deeply repressive, genocidal regimes, which perpetrated false narratives in order to create an enemy. You are talking about. hundreds of millions of people who bought into that narrative or apparently bought into that narrative and uh, of course you had a holocaust you had a sequence of wars including the break up of yugoslavia and the post soviet union wars including the one that's going on right now but you've also had a gradual movement towards liberalism and towards values one would consider humanist in quite a few of those places which to my means mind means that give it enough time and maybe the example and this is the horrifying part maybe you end up with a a holocaust or a world war 2 or uh, a scenario where you know hundreds and millions of people are sent off to labor camps maybe you need that sort of horrific example before a society wakes up and says hang on this is not a good idea but again if you give it maybe 20 25 years eventually you will get things like uh, the czech republic slovakia bulgaria romania not every east european country but quite a few of them ukraine itself the baltic republics which have moved from being repressive genocidal regimes with which had narratives of the other and targeting the other to being places which are no more bigoted than anywhere else in the world yes you probably will have tribalism anywhere in the world but i think state sponsored tribalism or a political system which has realized that it can monetize hatred i don't know how to put it or um, uh, you know to per perpetuate its grip on power i think that amplifies a lot of things very deeply you're right about the fact that yes of course so a bengali who's screaming his or her head off about the terrible muslim thing will calmly go down to nizams and have a beef khiri roll as well 
and you know be perfectly comfortable going eating a cuisine which is obviously influenced by other influences i mean our very prime ministers uh, elegant uh, churidars have an islamic influence which yes, is of course so, so ironic the the geometric patterns involved are clearly uh, persian and arab uh, driven but then of course said prime minister would probably argue that they stole it stole the ideas from some indian back in the second century ad <laughs> and uh, the point is that i i don't think that this is necessarily permanent but you know so many great nations uh, and i'm not using that word lightly uh, so many great nations have gone through this sort of period of extreme genocidal elements taking control what i think is different in the context of india now or the philippines or brazil or maybe hungary is that a lot of them have come to power through the ballot which is you know it's different from the earlier narrative where you had one man one vote one so you know, um political party seizing power through a revolution and basically perpetrating it by holding on uh, so <laughs> um preference falsification is yeah it's a, it's a good m- matrix to look at this to try and look at this but it doesn't necessarily tell you what you need to do to get past it and that i think is a problem that india in specific and also places like america which is essentially split in on a 60 40 basis right now between the bigots and the non bigots will eventually have to deal with and i suspect that like a lot of social problems it will take maybe generations before you have some sort of stable future beyond this i mean horrifying thought about uh, the yanks had their civil war in the 1860s it did, it took them till the 1960s before they desegregated and ran the equal rights amendment even now just a cursory look at things like incar- incarceration rates and per capita for african americans versus average per capita tells you that um, there is still a problem with that community that's 160 years india started putting in anti caste legislation only in the 1940s it's been just 75 years so maybe and you know india tends to get things done very slowly so maybe it'll take another 150 years yeah it makes you sort of wonder a about whether the arc of history is really going in a particular positive direction as martin luther king would have hoped or um, you know i i think in his formulation it the arc of history bends toward justice but uh, you know i think both of us at one point would have thought it at least bends towards liberalism and you know fukuyama's whole end of history question mark but a i i i now increasingly wonder if it bends that way at all and b then you have to ask that how long do things take to play out at the sample size of history the sample size of you know these kind of political debates is really small it's, it's just it's, you haven't even you didn't even have space for them until about 200 250 years ago let's say the french revolution or thereabouts i i mean i'm just randomly throwing out a date but and i'm open to any other date you like but yeah you did not really have uh, the sort of debate until the 18th century and i mean it's really enlightenment onwards in a sense yes yes uh, i mean a whole rough load of variables falling in place and gradually over let's say 100 200 years worth of changes in political systems technologies etc etc but uh, yeah maybe 
maybe it will take another you know the old chauvin lies uh, famous statement that when he was asked about the french revolution back in the 1960s and he said it's too early for you to say how <coughs> events which happened in 1789 make have actually panned out you're the second person to quote chauvin lies saying that to me over the last uh, like this is a six of six recordings in delhi i think akash singh rathod mentioned chauvin lies or was it someone else but yeah i mean uh, and also there is that uh, you know one of my favorite quotes about how paradigms change one funeral at a time you know indicating that you're not really going to change anyone's mind now and the change that is actually visible is generational change and it, it just takes a lot of time that is uh, where uh, you see the i think the indian educational system the way in which it's structured has absolutely failed this country it isn't just that you have nonsense being put now in history or civics books it's a fact that at the age of 14 or so or 13 or so you are asked to make a call between whether you study the sciences or the arts and uh, depending on which stream you choose or which stream you are allowed to choose because let's face it no 13 year old makes this decision on his or her own, own bat you are completely cut off from the other magisteria um now i'm quoting somebody else but anyway you're completely cut off from the other magisteria so as a result you might know how to make a small modular nuclear reactor but you have absolutely no idea how history actually worked in india how regimes changed in india or anywhere else in the world and you have absolutely no idea how social or liberal systems social and legislative systems developed or for that matter you have absolutely no idea how markets work and that the fact is see my dad was a historian and a lawyer he liked working on archaeological digs when he was in his mid to late 30s and already dean of a college he decided that he wanted to pick up a degree in geology because geology soils stones etc come useful if you're fiddling around with archaeological things and he had to jump through hoops to actually get into one of those courses and just sit in on the lectures because he couldn't i mean his educational background did not allow him to actually you know sit for the exams or what have you and he had to actually jump through hoops to sit in for some lectures because he wanted to learn the subject and i think this shows up in in the fact that people who are highly educated are also highly ignorant snow talked about it in the um, cp snow talked about it in the english context back in the 30s and 40s where he said that you will get a scientist who cannot quote hamlet and you will get a a classically trained literature buff who does not know newton's laws of motion and it is pretty bad it is pretty similar over here i think at that level at least you failed people your education system has failed entire generations so a couple of questions one is about ideas and the other is about education and the question about ideas is that it seems to me that our terms of reference when we are having this conversation are ideas that have really in a sense come from the west come from the enlightenment onwards and so on which is and therefore they are you know very common among the english speaking elite to the extent that you and i when we have a conversation we have a certain common ground on which to have that conversation but that common ground is only between us it is not uh, you know it's not there in the rest of the country and this is partly because you know we haven't fought enough of a battle to inject our ways of thinking about the world into society at large and we haven't won that battle in the market marketplace of ideas and we haven't even 
tried we put a top down constitution we built a top down system and then we assumed that our job is done abhi sab liberal ho jayega and we didn't fight that battle as gandhi ji wanted to do and uh, and therefore we remain illiberal in the field of ideas and even the elites a lot of the ideas that we take up either by osmosis or by brainwashing in foreign universities are outdated and often wrong like a lot of the far left communist nonsense i hear from people who really should know better and have lived incredibly privileged lives and had the means and the access to educate themselves they are not educated even though they have phd's and that's a question about sort of the ideas space in india and my question about education there also is that i think that the you know the at fundamental levels our education system is flawed number 1 you know our current schooling system was really designed in the early 19th century to bring out workers for the industrial revolution kids of a certain age study together certain bunch of subjects if a monkey is you know tested on how it climbs a tree so is a fish and you know that absolutely doesn't make sense in addition to this the system in india is trained in a sense to churn out clerks from macaulay's india you know which is long gone but we still have the same system in place and a it doesn't change because of inertia this is the way things always are b you know schools functionally like our education system as kartik mulidharan uh, says uh, said in an episode with me doesn't actually teach people anything it is a sorting instrument that you sort out the best minds who go to iits who then go to silicon valley and blah 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 but that doesn't mean that you're doing education right in uh, 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 any way and what schools are in practice is a fantastic day care centers that is in yeah. a sense the only function of schools a real function of schools are fantastic day care centers and parents get some time off while their kids are being looked after somewhere but there's no learning actually happening and at at all of these deep fundamental levels in terms of how ideas are have percolated and i realize i'm sorry i asked you two questions so you can kind of take them one by one i felt they were related they are related certainly if you to run a thought experiment as you're saying that you're fine you grew up in an educated liberal anglicized background so we had early exposures to a lot of ideas if you're coming to this blind from let's say deeply conservative family background where you know the women stay in the kitchen and the widows eat vegetarian food and the rest of the paraphernalia and the concept of not having an arranged marriage or if you happen to be lgbt not having children to inherit your property is horrifying if you're coming from that kind of background you'd have to start by looking at things like hobbs and lock back in the 17th century or the 16th century and it would be like being hit with a sledgehammer because you'd be asked to examine concepts which are so ingrained that they've never actually been articulated to you you've been born and bred into it it's like the mad bible belt uh, christian who believes uh, trump tells the truth where do you even begin to start questioning that person's mindset and uh, i think we have that with the additional issue which is true where in that india's internal cultural diversity exceeds that of the U- european union we have more languages we have more ethnic groups we have more ethnic groups which have live cheek by jowl while hating each other i'm talking about not just the caste system but the religious fissures in within groups and we have a currency union and we have a sort of parliament which lays down broad principles in that sense uh, maybe the european unions you know the fact that they are self governing countries as opposed to uh, india's situation where you have states which have some few 
self-governing powers. Maybe that actually makes more sense because it would be difficult, for example, for you to create a syllabus which made sense both for a boy from Kerala as well as a boy from Tripura as well as a boy from Himachal. You, your lived experience in all three cases is so different. And of course, the fact that you have, you've sorted for the ability to, back in Macaulay's day, you sorted for the ability to add up numbers and to read a technical manual if necessary. That a printing press works this way, a gun works that way, etc. You're still sorting for the 21st century equivalent of those things. You're not really sorting for an ability to think abstractly. And yeah, that is a huge problem apart from the fact that uh, India has never invested in breadth of education, even our best colleges and universities do not. A boy who's studying electrical engineering in IIT could not for the life of him also study, let's say, international relations. The courses don't exist. The ability to take those courses don't exist. I'm not saying that he should. I'm just saying that the ability doesn't exist. If he wants to look at, to take one of my random hobbies, I like looking at the way perspective has been used in art across genres. You have, you know, the Western art perspective drawing thing where people have worked out by mathematical principles that, okay, there is a focal vanishing point in this picture, and if you put a head of Jesus or whatever in that point, people will automatically look at it. You've also got the East Asian scrollers, the long, long... 100 meter long scrolls which are describing entire epics where the perspective is used very differently. This vanishing point thing doesn't exist because it wouldn't make sense. But I'm saying that if you're looking at something like that, someone with an engineering background might actually find that fascinating, but he or she is not going to even know that this exists because you'd have to do an art appreciation course or accidentally stumble upon it. And that, I think, is a crippling problem because the other side of the equation is that the talented artist does not know about the fact that, yes, you can program a computer to work these things out in you know, to the third decimal point before you actually start drawing. So, uh, it's part of the whole lost opportunities thing, and it's also the reason why, um, what, you... I was just looking at the numbers. About 30 to 35 million Indians live abroad officially. That's around 2.5%, 2.2 to 2.5% of the population. They remit, meaning this is income surplus to them. They remit over a hundred billion US a year. That's close to four percent of GDP. If you talk to any eighteen year old, he or she will tell you that they want to get abroad. And a lot of them, the bright ones, will end up abroad. So if you're just doing a ballpark number, if 2% of your population living abroad makes something like 25% of your GDP. Uh, uh, because I'm extrapolating from the fact that, you know, this is surplus income they can afford to send home. And you've got a young population of which everybody wants to leave. What sort of opportunities are you missing out on? What is the opportunity cost of this brain drain. It's frightening. And the brain drain is really driven by the fact that you have bright people eventually figuring out that, yes, if I can get out of this extremely mm, 
straight jacketed um regulatory and legislative and social regime some are trying to escape family some simply don't want to go through the nonsense of 900 clearances to set up a business others want to do research in a good research institution and again you have regulations which prevent let's say harvard setting up a uh, a college uh, a lab in india without extreme government interference so for various reasons people want to leave the opportunity cost of this is huge and it's mm, lost opportunities are difficult to see and to account for but if you sum this up over a period well it's it's a number that sort of leaves you shaking india could possibly have been the third largest economy in the world 10 years 15 years ago if we hadn't had this brain drain and we'd had the growth rates these people have the ones who left the kind of dynamism they took away with them and if i might quote uh, vivekananda the he was talking about the buddha he said that the thing with him is that a certain amount of compassion had gone out of sanatan dharma when the buddha came along and the buddha put that compassion back into the equation call it compassion call it empathy anubhuti whatever you want to call it and in this case it actually translates into you know you can make a hard money assessment a hard financial assessment of this is what we've lost because we have a bad educational system because we have socially conservative society and i think the losses have accelerated because in the last 10 years you've got more illiberal some stray thoughts and firstly some thoughts about the education system that while i couldn't agree with you more that you know it doesn't make sense that people in say manipur and tamil nadu and haryana are being taught exactly the same things i'll take it further and i'll say it doesn't even make sense that all the kids in any one of those places all the kids in haryana are being educated in exactly the same way like i wrote an old column a link from the show notes where the analogy i drew was with a trip to the supermarket that if i want potato chips i'll get 40 flavors if i want shaving cream you know the, there's a world of choices to me mm-hmm. but uh, i don't have the same multiplicity of choices when it comes to education that if there's a uh, you know that an 8 year old girl today has just one limited option and that's it you know even all your education startups and all that are not really doing anything no. that is disruptive they are teaching the same syllabus only it is to excel mm. within mm. the learn, same learn system you learn two times tables then you learn how to you learn how to do mm. that calculus or whatever it is yeah but, so yeah. that is waiting for disruption where we can kind of figure out how each individual can get exactly the kind of education which would help them get ahead there is a flip side to this and the flip side to this is that that kind of personalization or the word that is more apt for what i'm describing is fragmentation has actually happened in terms of information like one yes. sort of scenario that worries me is if i'm a 15 year old today in some small town in india and a friend sends me a video on youtube which is some bigoted nonsense mm-hmm. the algorithm then takes over yes. and i will constantly be shown uh, live in a world nonsense. where oh, yes. that is my reality and there is nothing else and akash singh rathore put it very well when i recorded with him recently where he said that there is a danger that when two people meet each other it is not a person talking to a person it is an algorithm talking to an algorithm you have been and it's actually the same algorithm obviously but you've been taken yeah. in such different directions hmm. that they are entirely different realities hmm. and this worries the shit out of me yeah i, I mean and it can it is not only an amplification and putting you in a bubble and amplifying sometimes it can get ridiculous results i mean speaking from personal experience as you know i'm interested in animals in general and felines in particular so about a year and a half ago i suddenly started getting advertisements for 
of the sun protect mature women looking for young boyfriends toy boys this puzzle the hell out of me because i'm not a mature woman i i'm not by for any, toy boys <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination i'm not a toy boy nor am i looking for toy boys then i eventually figured it out i'd been looking for videos on mountain lions pumas cougars ah and cougar is a synonym for the older woman who's looking for a young man and at some stage the algo got confused and <laughs> decided that you know i was a good candidate for nigeria i mean this is this is a sort of subset subset of the prince of nigeria who's offering you large sums of money they, there are elderly princesses in nigeria who are offering you a deal to become a toy boy so uh, i mean but yeah it it is like that that if you do you can even mangle the algorithms to a certain extent by deliberately saying that okay today i'm going to watch pop music and the next two weeks or whatever or as long as you feel like it you will keep getting you know pop music recommendations happening and amazon uses a version of the same netflix uses a version of i mean the algos are different but they're all aimed at exactly the same thing keeping you on that platform as long as possible you are essentially the product and yes if you're self selecting for your education and what you wish to learn you're going to end up putting yourself in a bubble maybe in a bubble which is even more dangerous because you're talking about a 12 year old or a 15 year old who doesn't even know for example that certain subjects exist and maybe will never be able to find out because he or she will structure a course where it doesn't work in that sense i think uh, um, some of the american universities probably have the best sort of compromise in that they offer a very wide range of subjects including you know you can study electrical engineering and take an art appreciation course and get credits for it so uh, in a sense you have that opportunity and the other thing is that they don't straight jacket you quite so early into the all right you are studying physics and chemistry and mathematics so you will not study history and geography there are some interesting takes here for example you have not that many indians until fairly recently who were involved in geolocation work this is because if you're a computer if you're coming to it from the computer angle which is the programming angle which is where most people were coming from you wouldn't really have ever looked at geography and beyond the point if you're doing geolocation or navigation you also need to understand geography you also need to understand that if i'm sitting in a car on top of a mountain and there is somebody who is a thousand meters down but in the same straight line a gps satellite might well say that we're sitting in each other's laps and uh, for a while what happened was that while the indian programmers were perfectly competent they simply did not get this they simply did not get different differences in terrain and landscape etc etc now of course uh, simply due to the fact that there are so many applications which involve geolocationing uh, you know india has a lot of very good programmers in that space but it was maybe several years late getting into that revolution because you don't have the two you actually have to teach this is something i know from the uber and ola sort of experience you actually do not teach people in school how to read a map you had several iterations of drivers being told that you know a map is usually set up with north on top 
kind of thing and being taught how to locate themselves on the you are here principle you think this is intuitive and it is intuitive to a 6 year old you do not have this problem with a 6 year old who's natively growing up with gps but you had a lot of 25 year olds and 30 year olds who had to be taught so um yeah the the narrowness of the indian syllabus and maybe i don't necessarily think self selection would get you past it but yeah the narrowness of the syllabus is is a huge problem there are there are areas where you would simply not manage to go anywhere because you don't get the you need to digest information from a academic stream which you have never studied before you can do whatever you need to do i'm guessing isro is going to run into this problem now because while it's great at sending satellites up and landers up and the rest of it it has never really tried to send human beings up and keep them healthy and sane in space and that is the next stage in the process so you're going to have to you know drag in a lot of doctors and a lot of medical scientists bio bio scientists and make them talk to a lot of physical engineering guys who will have to be told that you know the human body works this way and this is what you need to do if you're going to send somebody up in zero gravity or one fifth gravity or whatever it is and i would be also interested in knowing how they intend to keep people sane for six month periods if you know you're sitting up in a capsule somewhere in the middle of nowhere listen boss so don't stay sane here what have you yeah. seen twitter recently no and i'm thinking the whole category of geolocation mistakes could also explain why sometimes cougars and toy boys can <laughs> land up in each other's laps but yeah. uh, you know leaving that aside do you think like a related thought that strikes me is that one of the problems with people's approach towards education in india is that it is very goal directed in the sense that even when you reach a certain level of prosperity it is goal directed ki bachche ko iit mein jana hai and then iim karenge mba karenge city bank mein vice president banenge but your whole life is set up in a goal directed sort of way and you know leisure time is not appreciated in that sense it becomes a time of just completely sort of zoning off and the whole value of reading books for the pleasure of it or you know going to a museum just to you know sort of yeah, just- reset your brain yeah just yeah the in between the time pass and the studying that there is a certain kind of thing you might do as a hobby um, reading books being part of that but yeah listening to music when you're not intending to make a career out of music but uh, or painting or any of any of a dozen different things or for that matter programming because you are interested in the subject the the concept of doing this without either a concrete social or monetary reward is very difficult for a lot of indians including i mean and this shows up in things like golf for example or bridge i don't play golf i do play bridge and in both games you have a a huge population of people who are just there because they see this as a good platform for building social contacts which will help them in terms of business or in terms of professional career growth it's sort of like an alternate linkedin that okay you get onto a golf course with a couple of people who are senior mm, professionals somewhere or the other and you know at the end of it you can probably monetize that relationship similarly with bridge 
and uh, david remnick in his biography of obama the bridge he talks about how obama used to play poker for a while because mm-hmm. it was a good way for him to get together mm-hmm. with democratic party officials and kind of become mm-hmm. part of that scene in the 90s yeah i would believe this because i mean both eisenhower and nixon both of whom were republicans used to play a lot of poker and yes they were you know circle. Uh, circle poker cronies who obviously had uh, in that sense uh, off the books comfortable access to the big man because of that yes but what i was trying to say is that you know you don't even play what is apparent leisure activities except f- because you believe that this is going to further you your career professionally in some fashion or the other i mean i've walked around the golf course it is not a game that has ever interested me but my wife used to play my father in law used to play and once in a while the interesting places because you know you have a large open green space in the early morning and i can understand why somebody might want to go out there and you know bash a ball around the same way that fine i used to like riding when i was a kid it's a similar thing you get onto this animal which moves in amazing ways and you're out there in the open at a certain hour when you know it's not too hot it's not too cold and the world looks very beautiful and i i don't get somebody who doesn't actually like playing golf waking up at quarter past 4 in the morning because he thinks that all right i have three vice presidents of citibank or g or whatever out there who will be playing golf with me and uh, unfortunately that's how a lot of people take it and i've been to bridge tournaments where you know people are fighting to get to play against some corporate honcho or some big businessman who's a well-known bridge player i mean who, who who's not necessarily a good bridge player but you know bill gates plays bridge warren buffett plays bridge deepak parekh plays bridge anand mahindra plays bridge so you have a lot of people and i don't know about buffett and bill gates but since both of them play a lot of tournaments and i would assume that their time is worth something i would assume that they act- actively enjoy playing the games and I, I i'm certain that in the case of mr parik he actively enjoys playing the game and you know he plays but if you're playing the game because you hope one day you will be sitting at the same table as this guy and you will somehow you know slip him your business card and then chat him up and get some business out of him i think that's warped i mean there is something wrong with the way in which you do business i think there's something wrong with you and me we are the weirdos that we dive into things for their own sake i mean the kind of utterly pointless rabbit holes that i have entered is but i mean no no but i'm kidding i mean i'm 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 glad i'm the weirdo and i'm glad you're the weirdo before we get to biography and start talking about your life which i which is where all the fun is <laughs> uh, i want to ask i, I want to put a thought experiment to you and I uh, put a question to you about something that's been completely normalized like earlier you referred to India is actually being way more diverse in Europe and all of that and it strikes me and it especially struck me when i read uh, Narayani Basu's biography of VP Menon mm-hmm. that that whole exercise that Patel and Menon embarked mm-hmm. upon mm-hmm. of putting this nation together mm-hmm. uh, either through coercive means or through promises that were later broken seems to me to be extremely troublesome to think about uh, in moral terms it's like fast track colonization what the british did over 300 years we did in the space of maybe two and a half three years whatever time it mm. took patel and menon mm. and 
it seems right at the heart of the founding of this nation state and i am of course as great a patriot as anyone i love this country but at the heart of the founding of this nation state you know there are those extreme acts of uh, violence and immorality and that makes me uncomfortable so that is one question that i have for you right what do you feel about that and also it sometimes strikes me that maybe it would have just been better for all of us on individual terms if we were many disparate states instead of one now i know there are people and you know your wife nalanjana i think is one of them if i remember an, an old conversation correctly where there is a fear that it could have led to a kind of balkanization and violence and things falling apart and all of that but then i wondered that maybe the the incentives would have played out the other way there would have been competition between states uh, you know governance would have been more of a priority especially borders were relatively porous so i don't know i mean counterfactuals are always hard but what do you feel take a look at the eu you have some 25 20 30 nations i often i don't know the number uh, i can't remember the number the self governing there is a currency union there is a market union there is a, a by market union not just goods but labor anyone can go anywhere there are significant economic diversity disparities between say a germany and a bulgaria or a romania etc again i do not often know the exact numbers yeah but there is significant economic disparity there is a sort of uber institution the european parliament which uh, lays out what i would call constitutional directive principles even though they are called laws things like the gdpr the general data protection regulations are really closer to being a sort of indicator which says that you can structure your laws your local national law data protection law in many ways but it should still fit with these principles and your every one of these nations is in some fashion electing representatives to that over institution you've also got statutory institutions you know which are looking at monopolies etc etc and of course it's not a perfect fit at any means but worth mentioning that these countries have all within living memory done their best to kill each other there are plenty of people around who have done their best to kill members of other nations in these countries take the analogy where india is concerned first of all the coercive integration is not too surprising if you look at germany in the 1850s and 60s prussia bismarck and prussia did precisely the same thing the united kingdom did precisely the same thing even america arguably did precisely the same thing when it came to integrating several states so unfortunately that's a factor of history but if you look at india in that model we have more diversity than europe we have more languages we have more local subsets uh, you have more people speaking tulu than you have people speaking czech and tulu is not even a one of the recognized 19 or 20 languages uh you have more economic diversity i think the difference between sdp in tripura and tamil nadu is greater than the disparity between and certainly the difference in quality of life hdi indicators between you know some of the the difference between goa and bihar would be far more than any two Bulgaria other countries in germany far more far more you have a currency union you arguably do not have a market union of the same levels while labor can more or less move from anywhere in the country to anywhere else your goods movements are still subject to far more in the way of regulations than 
the European Union. Latvia can sell stuff to Ireland much easier than Kashmir can sell stuff to Tamil Nadu. You unfortunately don't have self-governance. You don't have a scenario where the Kerala or the Tamilians can say, piss off your, you know, what you want us to do in terms of literacy or medical care is those benchmarks have been exceeded 20 years ago. You know, we have a fully literate population. We have a population where we're, we have Medicare levels where your doctor to population ratio is way better than the central directives or targets in this regard. And we would prefer to look at middle income countries or high income countries to see where we set our next targets. And this is just a random example of when it comes to HDI. But, um, or for example, the fertility rate in TN and Kerala is already below what you would replacement. So, the, you know, the nonsensical central directives in this, I mean, they're basically irrelevant where these states are concerned. At the other end of the spectrum, you do have Bihar and UP, where, you know, they're maybe 30 years behind the curve. If you had more self-governance, and if instead of parliament being this beast and the central government being this beast which basically raises the funds, has the coercive military force and makes bizarre laws, you had a scenario where your parliament was a sort of uber institution which set up directive principles and your states were self-governing, you could in theory have a a much better, a less tense, a less physiparious situation. In practice, I'd look at not contemporary history, but India in the early 18th century. If you take a look at the map of India circa about 1720-1725, and you take a look at a map of India right now in terms of states controlled by the government at the center, the match between the Mughal Empire, which was falling apart at that point of time, and the BJP, which as far as I know is not falling apart at this point of time, is pretty strong. The Mughals, say in Faruksiyar or Alamgir, not Alamgir, Shah Alam and Faruksiyar's time also con- largely controlled what is now Bihar and UP and bits of Haryana, eh? with local sa- satraps such as Wajid Ali Shah types over there. It had alliances between Marathas, Rajputs, and Rajputs who controlled not just Rajasthan, but large chunks of Gujarat and Madhya Pradesh. It had an on-off relationship with the Nawab of Bengal. It had an on-off relationship with the Nizam of Hyderabad. And it had trade relationships and uh, alliances with various southern sultans and with the sardars, the Sikhs who were already starting to become a political force, the Afghans who controlled large chunks of Kashmir, etc., etc. And it basically paid off the Northeast not to hassle the, not to harass the empire. Calling it an empire is pushing it, but not to harass the remnants of the empire. Take a look at that and take a look at uh, the BJP's current hold over India. 
and there's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence. You have regional satraps in Bengal, Orissa, down south. You have an alliance with the Marathas. You have the Sikhs and the Kashmiris who are not really on the same page as the central government. You control the Buddha belt. And, uh, of course, so most of us or some of us who have read history know eventually a multinational ended up in charge of this whole mess. And the maybe the difference is that if a multinational does end up in charge of the whole mess, circa 2030 or so, it will be a Gujarati multinational rather than a British multinational. That I don't know whether that makes you feel any better about it. But it could go two ways. You could get a completely chaotic period where essentially you kept the currency union, the country fell apart, people fought each other, the Nagas fought the Manipuris and the Kanadigas fought the Tamilians and etc. Or you could end up with a European Union situation where by and large everybody considered the British idiots to bullshit themselves into leaving the union and they are reluctantly admitting that they were idiots. And I would say that by and large most people consider that a happier situation than when, you know, it was 30 different fragmented markets with 30 different currencies and no real common points except that they were neighbors. The fact that um, a Pole can go and work in Germany or a Belgian can make chocolates in Poland is a big deal for everybody. I love the way you use, uh, I love the term you use, fizzy barriers, which I always say it wrong. I say pissy farious, which is also, so, you know, before we go on to biography, and I keep saying before we go on to biography, but before we go on to biography, a biographical tidbit about you I heard since you were mentioning regional satraps in Bengal <laughs> is that you have once written speeches for Mamutadi back in the day. So kindly, kindly elucidate. Uh, this is way back when she was an up and coming. Congress leader, so late 70s, early 80s, her ancestral, I mean, her family home, etc., is in Kalighat, which is the, you know, the center of the whole mother goddess worship place. Kalighat also has a sort of sub-locality called Potuapara, where the potter's who make the statues, who make other stuff, uh, hang out. Potuapara used to be an extremely good place to go in order to smoke ganja and charas. I, I mean, and to drink bhang and generally hang out. Uh, it helped that the next set of lanes is that of the uh, shady ladies who make a living out of pilgrims. So, you could sort of take in the sights while smoking your grass. And as uh, kids, I didn't live very far away from here. This is la three bus stops or, or walking distance from my my house, which is in which was in Bhavanipur. And uh, we used to go down there and basically smoke a few chillums in the evening. This is when grass was still quasi-legal. You could actually buy it at a government shop. In fact, my bus stand was called Ganja Park because there was a government shop which sold ganja over there. This was the official name of the bus stop? Yeah. the I mean, even now, it is still the name of the bus stop. Oh, wow. People will, you know, the mini bus wala will yell, Ganja Park, Ganja Park, <laughs> etc. So, anyway, so, uh, so we used to hang out there, and she would, she was always a 
busy person in the sense that she was always rushing around doing things and checking out stuff. And she would come and, you know, see this bunch of kids. And we stuck out in the sense that we were obviously at least economically slightly better off. Even those, quite a few of the Potwapara lads were in the same colleges as us, etc. We were economically slightly better off, marginally better dressed, whatever. And of course, Calcutta being Calcutta, having passionate political conversations in between, whatever. So she would come around and she would say, Aha, you boys, uh, you should, you are wasting your time. You should be in college and studying properly and whatnot. And we would say, yes, Didi, very sorry, Didi, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> then she would say, Acha, this is the next speech that I'm going to give, you know, at some random library when whatever, some, some random function. This was before she became an MP or anything. So, what do you think I should say? And she would sort of hand you this thing of uh, notes. You know, these are the sub things we have to talk about and uh, I have to talk about. And she would say that, can you sort of uh, structure and in Bengali, ek to guchi de. Hmm. Uh, structure and handle the flow and in between <laughs> taking drags of the chilla, we would say, the Didi, why don't you say this and then say this? And she would take notes. She wrote her own speeches. It's not that <laughs> we wrote her speeches. Would she also smoke up with you? <laughs> no, no. She didn't. She genuinely didn't. And she would occasionally affectionately hit somebody on the top of the head and say, you know, you boys are being naughty and such like. Were you naughty? <laughs> And she, we were, I guess, first recipient of, you know, the undiluted Mamata, so to speak. After which she would go out and give the speeches. And then, of course, in 1980, she beat Shomna Chatterjee, who was, who was then already a very well-known CPM MP and lawyer and later Speaker of the House, etc., etc. She beat him in a huge upset election. and became an MP and the rest of it. But, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of the... See, this is something people don't get about politicians. A great deal of the public image is often genuine. Mm, you know, the charm or the false charm or this is a person who's come up from the ranks or is you know, a simple 24-7 worker or what have you. Quite a lot of that is often genuine. The few politicians I have met have all tended to be 24-7 switched on kind of thing. And, you know, the connect with the electorate comes from the fact that they do have they come from those backgrounds and they do understand what's going on in the heads of the people who vote for them or don't. So, yeah, I mean, I I never wrote speeches for Didi, but... You contributed to the phenomenon in a small way. <laughs> I contributed to the phenomenon. No, there's a lovely so, video of hers, which is a very charming video, where she's talking to a party worker as he was in the audience, and she starts teasing him that, look at your Madhu Pradesh, you know, referring to his yes. bhori, as Bengalis would say, or his paunch. And yeah. he tries to convince her, ki, Nana, I mean, exercise kori, and she's like, kore you know? <laughs> And it's just such a lovely, charming video, and obviously yeah. genuine, and I can quite imagine that the, the, the tone in which she would have spoken to you boys also and like yeah, yeah, on the yeah, yeah. Mm. absolutely that uh, you know the elder sister who's loving but exasperated <laughs> yeah. by, this, by this bunch of idiots right so, 
let's get to biography and when i get to biography you know i don't want to get to your childhood also i want to go well before that like earlier you were talking about 250 years french revolution i actually want to go to 250 years and because you have something that i am very jealous i don't have you have a very deep sense of your family history and your cultural history and how far it extends back into the 19th century and so on and so forth and uh, while my history and the history of so many others would be terribly disjointed where you can probably you know go one ancestor before your grandparents but that's all everybody's anonymous is nothing happening there there are no narrative strands you don't feel you kind of belong to a particular kind of world or a way of thinking so take me a bit through your prehistory as it were okay uh, i guess i mean this is mildly embarrassing but there are colleges named after three of my great grandfathers so they were in diverse ways interesting people the fourth was a river pirate <laughs> so one of them one of my great grandparents was a doctor one of the first doctors in bengal and what was his name a chap called nilratun shorkar uh, another was a pioneering journalist ramanando chatterjee uh, the third was a, a lawyer who was probably this is under the brits uh, the equivalent of the supreme court was the privy council so he was the first guy i think the first indian certainly the first indian from the northeast to argue cases before the privy council and uh, there's a law college named after him in selchar what's his name chandu uh, so and the fourth lot the dottos basically had you know a sort of they had access to a decent landing ghat in selet and they were also basically professionals who valued education i think that's true for all four branches of my family so they ended up mm, you know a lot of them ended up being all sorts of, i have mm, you know have very highly educated uncles and cousins and i'm talking about distant relatives and all these people were remarkably fecund they all had lots of children and possibly because they were more educated than the norm most of the children survived uh, given infant mortality rates everybody in i'm talking 1870s 1900s had hundreds of children but uh, possibly because the slot was slightly more educated and slightly smarter at it uh, more of the kids survived so you have this enormous widespread network of first cousin second cousin third cousin fifth removed all over the place and uh, large chunks of my family ended up becoming brahma samajis which was i think purely driven by the reform and the social movement thing at the same time we have a 300 odd year old tradition of doing chundi puja chundi being of course ma durga but uh, you know she was the ishta devi the family deity and uh, when partition happened the idol idol and her jewelry etc was brought over the border kind of thing and even now that tradition of the annual durga puja continues this being done by a large bunch of people who are avowed atheists brahmo samajis uh etc so there's an there is a dichotomy there which i think you'll find in a lot of bengalis in particular uh, take the chitagong armini raid guys shurjo sen and co they were all committed marxists they were all committed atheists and they all vowed to fight for the country in front of makali <laughs> so 
So <laughs> you, you have to take that dichotomy into yeah, but yeah. So so the I think the Brahma Samaj and it's it's a tiny community, but it's a tiny community which has a disproportionate effect. Let's say in driving social revolutions and particularly you know if you list the Bengali uh, ethos um, what uh, you're talking the Nobel Prize winners were both Brahmos um, Jagadish Bos was a Brahmo Shottajit Rai is a, was a Brahmo Vidhan Chandurai the first CM was a Brahmo Shiddhartha Shankar Rai was a Brahmo so you have this and en- en- enormous numbers of uh, you know reformers and educationists down the line, etc., etc., who were very strongly into this whole thing, and I think very largely driven by the fact that maybe because of a lot of cultural factors, by the Bengal was one of the places which early on had let's say, large minorities of people who thought that the current social system, as in widows not being allowed to remarry, sati, as the case may be, women not being allowed to go to college, all this they saw as a, as evil. If you want to look at it that way, Calcutta University actually handed out degrees to women earlier than Cambridge did. One of my grandmothers was in Cambridge during the First World War. That's where she met my granddad. Uh, he was also in. And her degree was from Trinity, Dublin, because Cambridge at that point of time had softened to the point where they allowed women to attend lectures, but they did not give them degrees. In contrast, by the 1890s, you know, Calcutta University, Dhaka University was giving degrees to anyone who sat for the exams. Another of my grandmothers also, the other grandmother, also, uh, you know, she went to, she uh, married my grandfather because he said he would allow her to continue studying. And we're talking... 12, 13 year old. And she did her graduation from Dhaka University when she was in her 30s. And she did a postgraduate degree from Calcutta University when she was in her 40s with her daughter. Wow. So, you know, the commitment to learning was obviously very strong. I mean, this is, I'm talking about a housewife, a classic homemaker who basically brought up many children and, you know, organized meals for everyone, that kind of thing. So her commitment to education was obviously very strong because she, uh, you know, she went through this loop. So I think um, that way, uh, and uh, my family is half West Bengali, half East Bengali. And East Bengal technically Silet, which was part of Assam, pre-partition, and which was the only part of India where they actually held a plebiscite oh. about which whether to join East Pakistan or stay with Assam, uh, stay with India. So... In that sense, I'm, you know, the half and half is useful, and there are further contradictions there. My East Bengali side of my family were all committed Mohan Bagan supporters, <laughs> because Mohan Bagan was the first team which had beaten British outfit. So the nationalism, 1912 and the nationalism, etc. was a very big deal. Whereas quite a few of me and my cousins were East Bengal supporters because, you know, we grew up in the 70s when East Bengal was the team to support if you were into Calcutta football. I mean, uh, <laughs> Calcutta football is technically a joke. 
but we didn't know it was a joke until we watch started watching television in the 1980s and realized that you know you were something like 50 years behind the rest of the world in terms of the quality and skills you were seeing but there was that whole thing of swing all versus mohan magan and the rest of it so yeah so that's that's the family so and people wandered all over the world and got degrees and settled down in vague places and you know i have i have a cousin who's an undercover cop in canada i have an oil rigger cousin in norway i have random neurologists and biologists and physicists uncles scattered all over the place chaps with I have one chap who runs a Balti restaurant in London. Marvelous. So, and all this I know because we sold one of our ancestral properties in the early two thousands, where you actually had had under I think under Assam law to put together a list of all the possible claimants and get two thirds of them to sign off on the sale. So at that stage, it ended up being. a loop where we were you know looking at eight brothers and three sisters who had had five kids each who had also had random kids kind of thing so and they were all over the place again my family at least when it comes to getting married doesn't seem to have much in the way of barriers i have uh, but uh i have khasi cousins i have um bora cousins christians of course i mean they they married into i have a dogra cousin they married into all sorts of communities at various points of times i have a half i have a half swedish cousin who has actually been on a eurovision winning team because he was a sound recorder wow <laughs> so <laughs> you know so it, it, the, the, there's a completely crazy and and the thing is that i don't really know any of these people or i've met a few of them at some family gathering or some what have you and i'm perfectly happy for it to stay that way but it's an interesting background to come from and the other good thing there was that joint family so a house which had books scattered across about 15 disciplines my i mean both my parents were academics and a lot of other people in the family were also highly educated and in different disciplines so and no one ever stopped me reading you know you mentioned the football and one of my previous guests i think it was either our friend joy bhattacharya or nandan kamath they did an episode together if i remember correctly in one of them spoke about how his dad or somebody was uh, you know watching a, f- a football match of a foreign team in circa 96 and another channel was showing an india football match and the person actually asked in bewilderment that are they showing the india match at half speed because it was just the the disparity was yeah. so sort of ridiculous mm-hmm. so uh, uh but again our loyalties happen not because of quality of play but because of just so many other instincts that kind of come into it i want you to double click on a few of those things one is that many of my listeners would have heard the term brahmo samaj in a vague way they would have heard about these reform movements and etc in a vague way but what was it actually what did it mean for you what kind of ethos did it create for you which you uh, you know grew up under like i understand there is a sense that there is a diversity of ideas milling around where you can embrace contradictions like atheism and also an older cultural practice like a worship of maa kali or whatever there also seems to be in your family's case this respect that you give to reading and knowledge and the the beautiful serendipity of having many books lying around from all these different disciplines all of this so give me a sense of you know what the brahmo samaj was what it meant to a you know the society of that time and b to to you as, as a sort of an umbrella of ethos under which you're kind of growing up 
personally speaking the influences on me would start at the level of later figuring out that i met a lot of very bright people when i was a kid without necessarily realizing who they were second there's a whole host of hymns bengali songs which um, evoke emotions ranging from hunger to sadness the hunger because this would usually be fairly late into a sermon and you're waiting for the khichdi to be served my i think both my parents were closet atheists but they were very strong about the social connect with family and the rest of it so you have uh, two three uchabs and you know you have marriages and the usual hatches matches and dispatches things where brahmos i've actually been a brahmo acharya as myself despite not being a believer the acharya's job is to give upadesh advice and uh, any brahmo ceremony tends to be interspersed with people singing the songs generally are very well known compositions by tagore and other luminaries of the musical era so a you get and there is always food so you end up i suppose as a kid you end up associating the music with the food and with the ambiance the community always had a very large proportion of smart people for want of a better word and i'm talking about the 60s and the 70s when you know you had people like mohalal nobish uh, floating around still in his late uh, not in his dotage but i mean in his later years anecdotage hmm. and nirod choudhury etc etc so nirod wasn't a brahmo but he he had worked as an editor under my great grandfather so he had a strong connect from there that's a famous ramanand chatterjee that's the ramanand babu yeah uh, so in terms of what i think the brahmo samaj does is it pairs down dogma so if you believe in the tenets of brahmanism what you are being told is that right read the vedas there are there is this laundry list of natural phenomena which has been personified as gods and goddesses they are all manifestations of one creator who is formless etc mm. it does not impose any dietary requirements it actively rejects caste it actively rejects dogma in the sense that brahmos encouraged widows to eat non vegetarian food and to wear jewelry and um, colored sarees and it actively encourages you to break caste and religious barriers in the sense that you can eat with anyone you can feed anyone and you use the same utensils to cook for any one kind of thing so if you <laughs> put that together and for someone like me or for amartya sen or many other brahmos i know what happens is that at some point during the process you also realize that hey you can take this creator out of the equation 
and the universe still probably continues to run. And again, this would not be doctrine per se for a Brahmo Samaji, but if you're taught that, okay, 3000 years ago when the Vedas were written, natural uh, phenomena was personified as gods because we didn't know how lightning worked or why it rained, etc. Well, you take it a logical step further and say that, okay, we have now figured these things out. We've also figured out how stellar equations work. We understand how atoms get split at least to a degree. And every year we figure out more about the world. And the deeper you've gone into natural sciences, you found explanations that do not require a creator, which extrapolating from there, you don't need a creator. And the other thing is that uh, while, like any other religion, it has its problems in terms of what is socially acceptable or not, it has far fewer problems in that respect than most religions. Religions aren't really defined by uh, supposed core beliefs. They're defined by what you're allowed to eat, who you're allowed to sleep with, and what you're supposed to do with people who are who don't share your belief system. And in those terms, I think it's a very human religion because you're allowed to eat anything. And uh, while promiscuity is discouraged, this is one of the problems with the religion. You're allowed to sleep with anyone or marry anyone, as the case may be. And uh, you're supposed to treat people, regardless of their beliefs, as human beings, as your equals. So I think in that sense, it is a good religion to grow up with. And I referred earlier in this conversation to social reformers who saw certain practices as evil. The classic scenario there is that you need to step beyond dogma and having been told that, you know, widows must be, must wear white and not eat meat, to realize that you are doing this to a human being. And that goes further. I mean, there are, enumerating the social evils of society would take us many days, and there's no point in doing that. All I'm saying is that because this religion rejects a lot of dogma, it may be people who grow up in it are trained to look at and reject dogma if if it conflicts with normal moral, normal moral values. You see a human, it walks and talks like a human. It seems to have the same, broadly the same behavioral characteristics as you do. You don't give it labels. I should not be using it, I suppose. I should be using they as the pronoun, pronoun in this case. But uh, yeah, so you don't give it labels. You interact with any person without trying to figure out you know, what their religion is and what their beliefs are and getting in the way of that. That also involves, of course, not being sucked into pernicious practices because they're sanctioned in some religion or another. Again, I won't get into that because then you'll get cases thrown at you by various people, but every mainstream religion has huge problems somewhere in its in its definition of what is socially acceptable and unacceptable. And maybe if you're trained to look at dogma and doctrine and say that, hang on, it doesn't matter if some wise man 
three thousand years ago or two thousand years ago said something. Maybe that wise man was talking nonsense. And uh, if it doesn't work right now, chuck it out the window and look for something that does work better. There's an enormous amount of Brahmo contribution to education. In fact, indeed, that is why the Brahmo Samaj and incidentally the Ramakrishna Mission filed for status as minority religions. <clears throat> Because getting back into the Indian system, the Indian government likes having control about over its educational system. Even if it mismanages the educational system horribly, it will not easily allow other people into that space. And uh, one of the ways of getting past this is if you're a deemed minority institution, so there are a whole bunch of colleges and schools, mainly in Bengal, which are run by the Brahma Samaj, which had to file for minority status, and the Ramakrishna Mission did it for similar reasons, because it runs a large network of schools across the country. And uh, the Contribution to education in that sense, I think, is a very big deal. Because, well, for the obvious reasons that, um, particularly in areas like uh, pioneering women's education, I think the Brahma Samaj did an enormous service to the country. And, well, you know, the thing is that uh, by the early 20th century, uh, it had a 100% literacy rate. It's a small community, which of course skews the stats, but it is also true that there were very few communities where all the women could read and write, and most had been to college. And uh, getting into the old argument of, you know, you educate a woman and she will make bloody sure that her kids are educated, etc., etc. So, plus, the other takeoffs like fertility rate drops and etc. So I think it it was obviously a force for good for a fairly long period of time. And unlike other religions, maybe it is phasing itself out gracefully. In the sense that, you know, the community was never very large. It is Currently, I think there are maybe less than a hundred thousand paid up Brahmos. I'm one, by the way, in the sense that I pay a subscription fee to help keep things running. And uh, many of us are not, in that sense, believers of the central doctrine of there is this great formless creator. But we like those social implications of a religion which tries to make you think for yourself. And uh, um, <laughs> low fertility rates and the rest of it. And none of us have, uh, uh, I don't have kids, but a lot of my Brahmo friends who do have kids haven't necessarily pushed the kids into, you know, um, becoming a Brahmo, so to speak. So, it'll you buy in another generation or so. I would assume that a large proportion, even of the community as it exists now, will have disappeared. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that is what should happen to religions. It has happened, for example, to Christianity in Scandinavia. Well, you know, the majority or the vast majority of Swedes and Norwegians are no religion. I mean, they are, by, in, by Indian definitions, they are Christians of some Protestant Lutheran persuasion mostly. But uh, by their own definition, they don't have a religion. They haven't, they haven't actually been to church or been baptized or 
They've been to church in the same way that I've been to see the pyramids. <laughs> and at the same time, maybe another input for me is because my dad was into archaeology and he was an ancient historian and the rest of it. I've had the privilege, and I would call this a privilege, of seeing a lot of ancient temples, mosques, Buddhist viharas, etc., at close range, being guided by experts who pointed out the iconography, who pointed out how things used to work. And, you know, you take that experience as transcendental in a very peculiar way. The dominant religion of a space of any given place and time always has the money to hire good art artists to hire good architects to pay the poets and the musicians to perform so a hell of a lot of very high quality cultural input is inextricably linked with religion and for me i see that the same way as literally I see the pyramids. I love the Norse sagas like the pyramids. I'm willing to visit any religious uh, place of worship. Uh, in fact, I wrote a book about the holy places of the Punjab. <coughs> I'm willing to visit any religious place of worship simply because it's likely to have fairly interesting art. The religious part of the experience may be zero, in the sense that there is no belief of faith involved, but you're fascinated by the sheer quality and skill of an imagination of the people who've done that work. So I guess um, that also helps you be a syncretist, for want of a better word. You see that. All major religions have horrific, certain horrific aspects to them, but they have also inspired people to do great work, including great social reform, etc. In any case, to take... This is something which... Uh, <laughs> I mean, might sound a little provocative, but if you look at the Shariat, it was point by point a more humane criminal justice system than the one that existed in Europe pre Enlightenment. You amputated a hand for thieving whereas you executed somebody for thieving. You said a woman's right, you allowed for a woman's right to property, and you said that she could give witness even though her witness was worth half that of a man. At a point of time when she did not have a right to property in Christian Europe, and she could not give evidence in court. So, I'm just saying that arguably the Shariat was for about a thousand years. It was a better and more humane system than that prevailing in Christian Europe. And, uh, <clears throat> and it was certainly a a huge step forward for the nomads of Arabia. <laughs> so, uh, I think religions, I guess at some stage, contribute to reform and then they hit a sell-by date. Unfortunately, people who believe in a religion don't necessarily want to acknowledge that there is a sell-by date as well. 
Yeah, and also to go back to the old quote of how paradigms change one funeral at a time, perhaps religions die one funeral at a time as a later generation may not believe in it. Seems to me to be almost a natural progression then that something like the Brahmo Sama should indeed die if it does one day because I would have imagined that in one particular point of time, it served as a haven for free thinkers where they could now call themselves Brahmo Samaji and still be part of society in a way and still be part of a conventional setup while retaining their free thinking. And today you don't need that framework. You can, like I am, just be mm. a free thinker and say, you know, fuck off to every religion without needing to, yeah. you know, give a label to yourself. I'm struck by, you know, the, the point you mentioned that one of the places where its attitudes wasn't that as progressive as the rest of them was promiscuity and that term itself seems interesting to me because it's it it has a pejorative connection to it i'd rather use a term like sexual liberation which mm -hmm. kind of indicates that and obviously in india just through the lens of the control of women's bodies you can understand a lot of what is happening in society like one of the great revelations of you know and your good friend tony joseph's uh, book is that for the last 2000 years uh, like before 2000 years we had all our different migrants from all over mm. the place mm. mingling and partying and all of that but for the last two, 2000 years there's been this intense caste endogamy and endogamy obviously then leads to this urge for female seclusion and the desire mm. to control mm. women's sexuality which leads to some of these terrible regressive attitudes towards women and some of them were perhaps exacerbated by um, um, you know the british colonizing us because some of our attitudes towards mm -hmm. sexuality are just victorian attitudes they're not even sanskari mm -hmm. as it were uh, a large proportion of what i meant these are again this is uh, uh, offhand you're talking about the 19th century when polygamy was rife where there was a large, a large latitude for hedonism in the upper classes. If you could afford to have your dancing girls and your drink your wine, you you would do so. <clears throat> you know the the classic stories of the zamindar babu, what have you. So you're coming from there to a religion which actively propagates monogamy, which, while it says that widow should remarry, is very, very anti-sexual relationships outside of marriage, and is against against the whole hedonism thing. In that sense, there's a very strong puritanical streak. There's a classic story about uh, one Brahmo leader who was on the street and a passing stranger asked him that, sir, this is Mahalanubish's father-in-law, by the way, asked him that, sir, can you direct me to the Star Theatre? On the Star Theatre being this notorious place where cabarets, etc. used to happen. And of course, being a Brahmo, he would not lie. So he said, yes, I know where it is, but I will not tell you. <laughs> Jani Kintu Bolbona. Brilliant. So, and, you know, he was proud of the fact that he had saved some youth from falling into the clutches of a cavalry dancer or whatever it is. So they had these peculiar issues and, you know, the whole thing about rescuing fallen women. This was another very Victorian attitude. And now, sex workers in India are treated horrendously. They have always been treated horrendously. So in that sense, the Brahmo drive to rehabilitate sex workers and to ensure that their children at least got an education of some degree was laudable. But it also meant uh, that there would be that small percentage perhaps of, let's say, the smart sex worker or the escort who had actually carved out a uh, space for herself, perhaps because she had a rich patron or whatever, who would have been considered uh, 
beyond the pale in Brahmo terms. In fact, the, you know, she, she couldn't be slotted into the Brahmo landscape. The, the Mary Magdalene Noti Binodini concept, the, you know, the fallen woman who falls in love with a great religious reformer, Jesus or Ramakrishna, as the case may be, and hence changes her lifestyle and becomes a saint. That is a sort of meme that runs through a lot of religious histories. But the concept of a Mary Magdalene who just continues doing what she does, or a Binodini who continues doing what she does, and that loop is something that the Brahmos really wouldn't have been able to handle. And the insistence on monogamy, again, is totally understandable given the fact that a century before you actually had a bill that banned multiple marriages, you had this scenario where man would marry 15 times and, you know, leave 15 widows behind in terrible conditions. And uh, so, okay, you to I totally get where it comes from, but I think it got pushed a little too hard. Context matters uh, so much. Yes. Let's go back to talking about your childhood. So, you know, I've got a sense of the sort of the social ethos and you know the attitude towards learning and all but you know what what was your childhood like what were the kind of books you were reading just give me a sense of the texture of your days you know and i'm guessing you grew up in calcutta and elsewhere take me through the different geographies of your childhood and also what was it like both parents were academics and so i grew up in close proximity to cam uh, campuses and in an ethos where practically every second person I knew was connected in some description to academia. This was during the Nokshal period when idealistic young men and women were also killing academics and fighting the cops, etc. on the streets. You grew up with a scenario where there were pitch battles on the streets all the time. Like I'm saying, I saw murders. Uh, my father's boss was the vice chancellor of Jadapur University. He was stabbed to death on campus in front of maybe 30 people. I've seen a policeman directing traffic being shot by a pipe gun by a guy who just walked up to him. I've seen a guy chucking bombs from a roof, people getting a lamplighter's ladder to get onto the roof. I mean, this sounds like something out of, you know, a medieval siege. And then chucking him off the roof. I'm just mentioning random incidents. I've been in buses something like four or five times where bus has been stopped, people have been politely or not so politely asked to get off, and then the bus has been set on fire. And you were inured to the fact that there were certain areas where people would be chucking bombs at each other across the street all the time, or shooting at each other. Um, my... About five batches senior to me in school, there were a bunch of guys who had by the time by this time got into college, who staged a attempted breakout from Alipur jail, which ended up with something like forty people dead. Plus, there were the the whole encounter thing and the rest of it, and there was that bizarre routine that at certain levels the son of the inspector general of police was a friend of mine he's still a friend of mine Shiddhartha Shankar Rai was a you know a Brahmo in good standing 
and uh, obviously the orders to carry out encounters. I think this is the first time that the encounter became an art form in the early 70s. So the orders to carry out encounters were coming right from the top. And I, I mean, I, I lost count of the number of people I know who, you know, had somebody in their family encountered. And a very large proportion of this was middle class, fairly well educated Bengali intelligentsia. In fact, I would say one reason why Bengal collapsed after that is really that you wiped out an entire generation. This probably happened in Punjab as well in the 80s. But so after my dad's boss was killed, my dad as the most senior person on campus became a target. Plus he had at various points of time worked with the Ford Foundation. So he was CIA or whatever supposedly mm. <laughs> never saw a cent of whatever money he was supposed to have made but anyway so uh, we did a three-year stint where he set up what is now Munipur University in Munipur so it, living in Imphal I can still understand Maitai and Nagami so and I have a sense of where the current conflict is coming from because you also had a sense that okay these areas are Kuki, these areas are Tankul, these areas are Maitai and you have different sensibilities too. I'm talking as a 10 year old boy, 10, 11 year old boy. You had different sensibilities to account for if you were wandering around in any of these places and at the same time as a kid you sort of had license people were not going to shoot me they might have shot my dad possibly but they wouldn't shoot me and uh, we were living in this big bungalow in this very green part of the Imphal valley I've visited six or seven of the biggest sites of World War II battles and the memorials. I've been back later, etc. You have some amazing artifacts over there because you have abandoned airfields, etc. And uh, you had a decent public library, which was fun. One of the few places I've been, in fact, in India where you had a decent public library with a lot of good books. And uh, I enjoyed myself. It was, I guess, as a growing up experience, it was a very nice growing up experience. I got on with my dad's driver who had kids the same age. I've wandered around, I've been guests at local weddings etc. Guess meaning literally gone off and lived with a family for three, four days while some somebody in that family was getting married. I've crossed the Burma border a dozen times. Legally, you had this thing where Moray and Tamu, which are the border towns, um, Tamu being on the Myanmar side, uh, you had this thing where a local could be in the other place from sunrise to sunset. So people used to, you know, go over, cross over to do their shopping kind of thing on a fairly regular basis. And it was fun. You are also very aware of the fact that it was fun with an undercurrent of tension because there would be shootouts, there would be times when you got blacked out for two days, or there would be times when, you know, the whole place was under curfew. <clears throat> the Bangladesh war happened while we were there. So again, there was this huge buildup of uh, forces, more out of Meghalaya than out of Manipur, but And all of this is stuff that you... 
you store the memories at that point of time at, and i'm talking as a 10 year old you store the memories as a 9 year old really and you sort of figure out later that oh okay this is what was going on at that point of time i suspect that in a lot of ways uh, i have probably grown up with mild ptsd because you're used to uh, random acts of violence at a level where you sort of don't take it seriously but at another level you're also very jumpy yeah. i'm guessing that this is true for anybody who's grown up in kashmir in the last 30 years or in certain parts of the northeast or in the punjab in the 80s you have a similar sort of mild ptsd i'm struck by uh, you know your young experience of naxalism your father being a potential target and all of that and you know when i think about the great folly of naxalism there's also that old cliche that goes about how if you're not a communist at 18 you don't have a heart if you're not a capitalist at 28 you don't have a brain and when we are young we get drawn to ideologies that appear to explain the world and make us feel virtuous and noble and a lot of these ideologies like communism itself as we th- saw through the 20th century can lead to extreme acts of violence and can really take you down a terrible path and of course you know naxalism was a tragedy in the sense that we lost so many brilliant young young people to really unnecessarily who could have achieved so much oh, yes. but was it also for you a sort of a cautionary tale into what could happen if you gave in to that kind of ideological uh, sort of direction and dogmatism and uh, all of that i think extremism is always a bad routine and the thing is that after that i also had the experience of West Bengal being ruled by a communist government for many many years and i've also wandered around in eastern europe when it was ruled by sundry communist governments and they were all appallingly bad they were appallingly bad in terms of the mismanagement of official resources they were appallingly bad in terms of what they did to the lives of common people and you know i don't think there is much of a difference between the right and the left when you're talking about extremist governments you end up with the same routines of you have personality cults you have appeals to nationalism you have scrubal economic and scientific theories being chucked into the ethos you have terrible educational systems at least eastern europe did the thing of fast 100% literacy but then you look at something like russia which has been 100% literate for you know 50 years and it is in such a horrific condition as a place you realize that there's something wrong i remember meeting an east german in this would be around 1986 and he had never heard of eric maria remark wow. all quiet on the western front it, it was literally i was reading an english translation of one of remark's books and ute said you know looks like a german name and i s- sort of had <laughs> light bulbs going off and saying hang on uh, you know one of the most iconic anti war novels and it, uh, it's probably sold 100 million or 500 million copies in various translations and been made into five different movies and uh, i mean that wasn't the only book he wrote he wrote something like 15 best sellers or whatever and you never heard of him and he said no and then this guy being of an inquiring mind and a very brave man went to his local library <laughs> he had some sort of connect with the librarian who explained to him that look first he was banned by the nazis because 
obviously he was not showing up Germany's governments in good light. And then the ban was perpetrated by the communist regime, which came in later. So you can't get his books in German, but if you want to read them in English translation, they were in the local library. So he borrowed and read Remark in English because Remark wasn't available in German and Remark had been wiped off the educational map of East Germany to the point where you know, a well-educated young East German had never heard of him. Remarkable. <laughs> Literally. And you've had similar issues, I think, with left-wing and right-wing governments. Who they wipe out is a different matter, but I think you've had similar issues everywhere with them. What makes me both unhappy and hopeful about the current regime in India is that I think at a certain level, the Soviets and the Chinese and their satellites allowed for a release in tension. I will explain what this means. In the former Soviet Union, you could not criticize the government or the party. You could get blind drunk. You could eat anything you wanted. You could sleep with anything you wanted. Ditto for China. Plus, in China, you're allowed to make money without the government overtly interfering with you. That creates a lot of safety valves and releases. The government isn't really getting into the way you order your social life and your you know, your day-to-day -day interactions. The current establishment in India is very, very deeply invested in trying to hassle you in those respects, which means that you have less in the way of safety valves. And analogies in, in this respect are probably you know, stretching things a bit too fast, far, but if you don't have safety valves, things tend to explode earlier. And in a sense, you know, the Soviet Union could carry on for 70 odd years because, yeah, you could go out and get drunk, you could meet somebody you found attractive and go to bed with them. And of course, there were no food restrictions if you could find food, you could eat it. The Chinese, you can get rich, you can travel abroad, you can sit on a beach in Thailand with whoever you want. So you have even more in the way of a safety valve. You can't do any of this in India without many fingers being pointed or being hassled in multiple ways. So I don't know whether that is a good thing or a bad thing, in the sense that are you more likely to set up an explosive reaction or not? At some level, human beings are human beings. We don't like being told what to do about everything in our lives. I mean, you know, you like, whether you wear a lungi at home or you wear half pants is not really anyone else's business, but this government does seem to think that it is their business. Oh, nothing at all. Do not send me a notice if I am naked, which to be honest, no one has yet. But mm -hmm. I must also point out, I agree with everything you said, I must also point out that Stalin and Mao did kill tens of millions of oh, people. Yes. However, 
there is something that is happening here. I mean, I think there's a difference in category because the issue there with Stalin and Mao, the issue was a state and the authoritarian individuals in charge. Here, I think what is happening in politics is a symptom of a cancer in society and that there is a deeper social problem. It is not as if anti-Muslimness is being imposed upon society mm. by a top-down authoritarian leader. It is unfortunately part of the fabric of our society and all parties to differing degrees are playing to that, you know, including the Congress, mm -hmm. including up. That's true for anti-Semitism across Europe. I exactly. mean, um, the, you know, the pogrom is a Russian word. The Russians were carrying out pogroms long before the, the Tsars were carrying out pogroms long before Hitler got into the act and, and decided to institutionalize it. The Poles were perfectly happy to have the Jews, um, Poles and the Ukrainians were perfectly happy to have Jews being mass massacred. They didn't care who was doing the massacring. And uh, you have similar levels of, yes, anti-Muslimness and anti-Christianness and anti what have you -ness happening across the um, political map of India. and. Yes, it is true that this government hasn't killed tens of millions as Stalin did or as um, Mao did. But that is not because they necessarily care about yeah. killing tens of millions. You have a disturbing lack of empathy when it comes to, you know, coercively pushing very very invasive le legislation or something like demonetization down the throats of people who it did become existentialist. The way the COVID lockdowns was handled did become existentialist. You don't really know how many people died in, uh, how many preventable deaths there were, let us say, in that one year or so when COVID was raging. So I think there is a lack of, this government has also built jails for people who do not qualify as Indian citizens. It hasn't been able to fill those jails yet because there has been pushback, but it would like to fill those jails. After all, why did it build them? In fact, even on the question of tens of millions of deaths, if they, if A, it was possible and they could get away with it, and B, it would help them win elections, you know, maybe they would. Yeah, I don't think there would be an issue uh, in terms of moral qualms about it. Uh, it's that they lack the reach to do this without necessarily running into a problem, and it would be a dubious electoral strategy beyond a point. And people bemoan state capacity, India ka state capacity nahi hai. Sometimes I think it's good that we have an incompetent state because some of our laws are so incredibly bad and, you know... Uh, this is the... It's the Frank Herbert thing, you know, Frank Herbert. Uh, I mean, the... Not the Dune novels, but the George Mackey novels where George Mackey is this super James Bond in the 25th century kind of thing. And his job is to prevent governments. He works for a government department called the Bureau of Sabotage, <laughs> whose job is to prevent governments running smoothly, to throw stand, sand in the works of governments running smoothly, because a smooth running government can do a lot more damage than a government that's incompetent and has bureaucratic hold-ups. So yeah, I mean, in that sense also, you're lucky that this is a continent-sized country. You know, hell, breaking loose in Manipur does not necessarily affect you in Delhi. But I'm, I'm not saying it, you should not feel unhappy about it, but it doesn't necessarily directly affect your life in Delhi. In that sense, you have ways to run away which you wouldn't in a small country.
I love the phrase Bureau of Sabotage, which of course has the initials BS, yes. similar to a <laughs> publication you have worked at. So I'm noting all these connections, uh, kindly notice. I want to sort of dig into some of the things that you're passionate about, which I've known you as being incredibly knowledgeable in over the years that I've known you, you know, things like military history, chess, bridge, uh, on Twitter, you uh, point to sex and religion as being two of your great interests. We've already done religion, so I won't ask you to go there and we will uh, come to sex later because um, certainly we must speak about that. But I was wondering when you mentioned Manipur and, uh, you know, interest in World War Two, all the unused airfields and all of that, I want to ask ask about A, that time in general for you and B, specifically how your interest in military history developed and, you know, what fed it over the years and so on and so forth. I have multiple ancestors who at some level or the other have been involved in the defense forces, either army or navy or air force as the case may be. So there were books lying around. Second, the Manipur experience was probably, in retrospect, a trigger because I visited places uh, like Palel, where there was a huge battle, which has abandoned barracks, abandoned airfields. I visited Churachandpur, which has a INA memorial because that is the deepest point of penetration by the INA in 1944. Netaji gave us iconic speech over there. I've taken, I've looked at memorials all over the Northeast, Kohima, outside Imphal, the Red Pagoda, etc., etc., including Japanese memorials. I've always been, I suppose it sounds gruesome, but fascinated by battlefields, meaning trying to figure out why a specific location uh, is considered suitable for people to kill each other in industrial quantities. This is always or usually for a strategic reason. I mean, there is a reason why Panipat has featured so many times. In a sense, similar to perspective in art, like you pointed out. Yes. Where do you f hmm. Yes. There is a focal point which, or for example, Kharkiv in the Ukraine war. Kharkiv saw five battles in the Second World War and about three during the Russian Revolution. And it's seen two. So you've, you're talking about 10 battles in one specific place. There's a reason for that. Sekigehara in Japan. I've always been fascinated by what are the con contours which make a specific place more likely? Thermopylae. Thermopylae f has featured in battles in the First and Second World War. And, of course, the Persian invasion. Can, you, can you give an example of a place in India and what you learned about it? Panipat, the mm, <clears throat> Harki Patan, which is in Punjab, which is featured in battles in uh, but what, the um, Sikh like, Wars, why are, these places, uh, why, why are these places focal points? Usually because there's a transport nexus or there is no way of getting to a big strategic point like Delhi in the case of Panipat and holding it unless you fight a battle over there and win that battle. I, I spent a lot of time floating around and visiting battlefields. I read about military campaigns across history because, again, that's part of it. You need to know why there has been a battle over here, why Flanders and Belgium is the cockpit of Europe, why so many critical European, West European battles happened in that area. And uh, it ties in at a certain level to my interest in chess, which is a very abstracted sort of way of looking at battles. But um, it is it is the kind of thing where, again, uh, 
history tends to work in in long phases of and patterns which repeat not exactly but they do repeat so the whole thing about you know why has europe ended up where it is now if you're looking at this then you have to start looking at what happened during for example the napoleonic wars and which is a time when the europe in let's say 1810 is recognizably europe as of now as opposed to europe in 1400 where it was you know aquitania and uh, aleria etc various places which barely exist on the map now and uh, countries were not the countries they are now so you you look at this you look at why did why in was there this whole pattern of conflict at a certain point in history then again why is there a repeating pattern of conflict let's say in the 1860s and 70s when germany was unifying then the first and second world war similar things have happened in india with let's say the mogul empire which is one obvious connector also with things like the marathas because there was a sort of rise and fall shivaji happened then uh, there were some fairly incompetent successors and then there were a couple of highly competent peshwas and then again incompetence and uh you have you sort of get fascinated by the patterns this takes on and being human beings who look for patterns in everything you try to look for a a pattern which might uh, be in operation right now or maybe a long cycle pattern which will be in operation 20 years later or 30 years later it's the same reason why you would also look at economic cycles long longer economic cycles not not necessarily you know a three year business cycle but longer economic cycles so you're, you're looking for patterns and sometimes because the numbers pass belief i've been to wipers which is a small town in belgium and one reason for going there is because it has a peculiar calcutta connection the calcutta high court was originally built using the plans of the town hall of wipers then wipers went through four battles in the first world war and the town was obliterated by artillery fire and after the war they sent architects to calcutta to take a look at the high court so that they could rebuild their buildings but so you're talking about a place where uh, something like 60000 people died in one day i mean and died not because a nuclear bomb was dropped but because they were shot shell to death and this happened over a period of months i mean on a regular basis there were 5000 10000 people being killed every day and it sort of defies belief you go there because you're wondering how big is this place and how the hell could you sit here and do it similar things happened to me in gallipoli where you are literally talking about australian trenches and turkish trenches with less than 30 meter support separating them so i mean you're sitting in a trench you dare not put your head up because it will be shot off the other guy sitting there is going through the same thing when you are taking a crap you are literally crawling through a shallow tunnel for 30 meters in order to take a crap 
and crawling back at the end of this. And you're sitting in the middle of this for months. And the part of this uh, insanity also, you know, it happens on a regular basis in on the LOC, LAC sort of scenario. It's happening. It happens to some extent, I suppose, in Korea on the DMZ. Though there is that buffer zone. But it also defies the imagination that how the hell did you manage to pack so many people into this place and convince them that they have to kill each other? And quite often there are no answers. I've also done things like wandered around the Shenandoah Valley in America because um, that is a that is a campaign which barely features in the history books. Very few people got killed. But for a period of months, Stonewall Jackson was leading a very small army without any cavalry, m managed to tie down two and a half to three much larger forces with cavalry, with artillery, by sneaking around in the Shenandoah Valley and every so often threatening to attack Washington, D.C. He never actually attacked Washington, D.C. They never actually managed to get hold of him because he would have been wiped out if one of those armies had actually managed to force a battle on him. So it was this thing where the guy was, you know, spiraling around in this green area. It wasn't even a guerrilla campaign. He wasn't trying to kill anyone or, you know, attack them. He was just showing his face so that these guys would stay occupied over here and could not go into action anywhere else. And again, it sort of passes belief. How can 10,000 people wander around in an area without actually being intercepted by a much larger force? So some of it is like that. And some of it is just the waste. Mm, the Indian graves in France from the First World War in Gallipoli, in Mesopotamia. It's such a waste. Here were these guys who, you know, basically joined up because the army and the pension was a better life than being a farmer and ended up being shot in some random place, in some random battle which had absolutely nothing to do with them. You mentioned Stonewall Jackson, and mm. I was, you know, reminded of this chess anecdote. I think this was Nimzovich. Nimzovich didn't uh, like smoke blown on his face. And, you know, once he was playing Widmar, and he was sort of, I think it was Widmar, and he was kind of freaking out because Widmar, you know, got a cigar case and he kept it on the table in front of him. And Nimzovich called the tournament director, and Widmar said, But it's a cigar case, I haven't started smoking yet. And uh, Nimzo said, No, the threat is worse than the execution, as every chess player knows. <laughs> so, you know, I hope I've got the characters right, but that's yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty much uh, the it story. Is a story. Uh, it is a Nimzovich story. I can't remember who the cigar smoker was. Could yeah. have been Lasker, could have been a lot of other. Tarash, could have been Tarash could have been Widmar. All of this military history, I would imagine that like history, even when it doesn't repeat, it rhymes, as people say. So all of it is relevant. You see the same battles playing out. Mm. But my assumption is that there will never again be a, a, a battle of Panipat, that Gallipoli will no more be important. And Flanders, the only battle at Flanders will be one of my favorite cycling monuments, a tour <laughs> of Flanders, which happens every year. And, and yeah. because I, has a chain, has a, has modern warfare, though Kharkiv would seem to give a lie to that, but as modern warfare changed and it's changing rapidly so fast that a lot of those old paradigms don't matter, that a lot of those old patterns don't even come into play because like I did an episode on the Ukraine war with Ajay Shah and Ajay was talking about how, you know, they've got an Uber for artillery and there are these remote control drones. So even if you're on a trench, which is many miles inside, yeah, the, the remote control drone will the just come and drop out. technology has changed, but if you read Manstein's Lost Victories, 
monster in being and you look at what is happening right now in the counter offensive citadel and map it to citadel you're talking about people trying to take exactly the same territory with completely or rather with very different technology but yes they're fighting over exactly the same territory and yes of course the technology has changed it has changed i mean the first battle of thermopylae involved guys with spears going up against guys with swords and bows and arrows the last battle of thermopylae in the 1940s involved armored warfare and but yeah of course the technology has changed but you still end up fighting over the same terrain and you still end up with largely the same strategic objectives i think in many cases flanders i agree is unlikely to ever see another battle unless belgium has a civil war which is not impossible but is unlikely i can't really see the flamands and the french speakers deciding that you know they're going to kill each other by the way from a political scientist point of view uh, belgium's devolution is fairly interesting to look at because you know they very deftly managed through deep self governance they very deftly managed the situation where you have two bunches of people who speak different languages even though they can both i mean both bunches are bilingual but they do speak completely different languages and who you know the communist party of belgium has there are two communist parties of belgium they have similar manifestos but one is belgium for the flamands and one is belgium for the french speakers <laughs> so but uh, you know the whole uh, self devolution thing plus you've got a catholic protestant divide which is true for mm, holland as well plus a divide between fans of wout van aert and fans fans of remco evenepoel yeah. only cycling uh, geeks will get this i'm sorry yes okay uh, but yeah so belgium and maybe holland or dutch the dutch similarly the dutch have a monarchy but they never have a coronation <laughs> because a coronation would involve involving a religious leader to put the crown on and because of their history it used to be a colony of spain and the fact is that half of holland is still catholic it there would probably be a civil war about whether it should be a protestant bishop or a catholic bishop so they've never had a coronation but uh, the belgium example is interesting because of the i mean deep self governance uh, of i think a level that doesn't exist in any other country M- maybe it does but i i'm not a, a political scientist or an expert on this but i looked at it Uh, in the context of trying to understand panchayat raj which is a fairly obvious analogy and uh, i don't think uh, you have that level of self governance in any other country in terms of uh, the ability of local villages to raise taxes and to um, legislate what they do with those taxes i'll bring it down to that very basic level and you're talking tiny communities you know places which uh, this one street in malvia nagar would have more people than an average belgian village marvelous we are of course recording this in malvia nagar hmm. and this one street has more people than a belgian village uh, and yet there are no cyclists coming out of here shame shame Let, let's Take a digression from chronology for a moment, though it's not a digression. Digression because it's part of your narrative, and talk about chess because you mentioned how chess, in a sense, is a sublimation of the interest in military matters and military history and all of that. So, uh, and I, I've known you for the longest time as like you know at different points in time where you have you used to have a chess column, but you also used to blog at one point during one of the world championships. You had this fantastically insightful uh, blog where you were blogging about the games you've played. 
played at a very high level you have uh, co-written vishy anand's autobiography which yet to be published but and and you were a serious like uh, national level player in the 80s and all of that take me through your uh, you know journey playing chess what was it like in the early days was it a huge handicap that you were in india and not in russia for example what was your chess life what has your chess life been like you're also a very high level correspondence player i know Yeah I mean I switched to playing correspondence quite a few years back and the key differences are two things one is access to information instantaneous access to information the fact that you know I can download a 5 million game database instantaneously now and I can download the games of a tournament live while they're being played second engine analysis the sheer quality of engine analysis and the things we've learned from engine analysis it's not just that the f- fact that the engines can go deeper they have actually shown us stuff that chess human chess players did not know things like certain positions the way an alpha zero or a stockfish handles them uh has actually uh, there was a very insightful I suppose monograph would be a good way to put it written by Peter Heine Nielsen who's been on in second and is now uh, Carl- Carlson's major second about adapting ideas from an alpha zero uh Matthew Sadler who's another very strong chess player come computer man has written excellently about this So you have you put those two things together and while you do need coaches you now need coaches really to take care of behavioral tics and to help people learn how to think you do not need coaches to give you insights anymore in the sense that you do not need a grandmaster to look at a position and say that hey you know this is a good move all you have to do is switch on stockfish and it will instantaneously tell you what is a good move and what is not you do need human coaches to help you learn how to calculate to learn how to understand positions to maybe to notice the key aspects of a certain kind of chess position and to give you advice about hey your this kind of player and this is what your natural inclinations are and this is how you should be trying to mm, strengthen your game so the difference is that you know we were looking at things like a two month delay on a six monthly compendium of physical games something like chess informant or you would go and chat up librarians at the soviet cultural center and say that dada can you get the latest 64 which was the official russian thing or uh shas which was the latvian uh, journal originally edited by mikhail tal and then by various other lodgings can you get this quickly from moscow because then you know we can take a look kind of thing and you knew that people in eastern europe had already seen and digested this information they had strong coaches who would tell them that this is a position you handle this way and that is a position you handle that way Um, they had these index card sort of systems where you know openings had been analyzed to fairly great depths and with a lot of midnight oil being burnt and plus again uh, not just the openings but middle game themes and end game technique the level of polish they had i read my first i had access to and read my first book on the end game basic chess endings when i was in my early 20s was this a ruben fine book yeah 
Yeah, this was the Ruben Fine book. Uh, when I was in my early 20s, by which time I had already been playing at the national level for several years, for about four years. And, you know, it was revelatory to learn which positions were winning and which were not. And Basic Chess Endings is a basic book. It is it is not definitive. It covers a lot of positions, but it also does not cover a lot of stuff. But, uh, you know, he had model endgames from here and there, and he had statements that, like, this position can be won this way, this position can be drawn this way, that kind of thing. And it was revelatory for me, and it was also a learning experience and a humbling experience to realize that there were 13-year-olds in Russia who knew this, who had just been taught this 10 years earlier. It's like you're learning the alphabet at 18, and they've learned it at 6. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, the analogy here would be the alphabet or mathematics. That you're doing addition, subtraction, they've done calculus. Yeah, they're already into calculus, maybe into multivariable calculus. So, uh, and it used to show up in the fact that the Indian thematic was, you would take enormous amounts of time in the opening and early middle game because you were struggling to make sense of positions which were completely new to you. And you'd be playing... An East European who, you know, would just bash out those moves with 20 seconds thought, perhaps. And there is something very intimidating about that as well. You're playing someone who uh, is obviously not even thinking when he's playing a very complicated position. And you're going nuts trying to work out all sorts of you know, what is there at the table. It's a game which equalizing access to information has changed the game and the way in which it's played, and that's pretty obvious. I mean, you look at the junior ranks and you look at the fact that India now has 84 grandmasters, most of whom are 16 years old or 20 years old. Uzbekistan is the Olympiad gold medalist, again with a team which was average age of 19. And uh, obviously it's, it's changed the way the game is played. It's also changed, it's democratized the game in a way which is difficult to describe. It's, yes, you have good players out of Russia still, of course, but you have good players out of everywhere now. And if you're talking sheer weight of good players, India is one of the best places in the world, if not the best. You have a huge... That's one place where the demographic dividend has paid. You have a lot of young, bright kids who have taken to chess, and thanks to Anand's example, their parents believe that this is a decent thing for them to be doing, and... They've done, uh, you know, they've, you have reasonably cheap data, so they've, they've gone and they've gone places in terms of the overall level of chess being played in India now, even at a very, even at a small event somewhere. I mean, every, yes, uh, Tamil Nadu is still the biggest place, but every state more or less has its five or six good players and by good players i mean grandmasters and you know even your state championships are pretty solid events it's also changed correspondence in that when i started playing correspondence which is in the early 2000s it was still a game where you used engines but you looked for very sharp positions where you might find, you know, a little tactical trick six moves deep, which your opponent was also using an engine, of course, hadn't gone that deep into it and tricked them, so to speak. 
now you play uh, really in the Carlson style. You play to keep all sorts of pieces on the board and to reach a sort of rich middle game position, which is not necessarily good for you or bad for you, but simply something that the engine will not be able to fully analyze and understand. So your opponent will have to make deep strategic decisions at some level. You're no longer going to beat anyone tactically in a correspondence game. In fact, when engine versus engine tournaments are played, they play preset positions because otherwise, you know, the engines are too good, they will just draw each other every time. So you sort of, you look for uh, really deep, obscure stuff like, all right, the one thing that my opponent must not do is exchange his dark square bishop. And if he doesn't realize that, uh, I will eventually beat him. Or that I can move forces from the queen side to the king side a little quicker than he can. No, you're no longer looking at tactical blows which will, you know, knock the other guy out. And this means the dichotomy, the difference between correspondence and over the board chess has also widened. At one time, uh, correspondence used to be the more tactically complicated thing. You were always playing for deep positions where you had capture, recapture, threat, going 10 moves deep and hoping that your opponent would not go that deep. You can still do that in a normal OTB game. In fact, a lot of people do. Uh, someone like Aruana or Nakamura is usually trying to do that, Aronian sometimes. But uh, you wouldn't do that in correspondence anymore. Now, in correspondence, you play for, I want to get to a middle game, which maybe I'll understand better than my opponent. And, you know, you mentioned Peter Heine Nelson's uh, monograph earlier. And one quote I remember from him at the time uh, Alpha Zero did what it did is about how I've always wondered what it would be like if aliens came to Earth and played chess. And now I think I know, you know. Mm. And the thing is, the stereotype most people would have had of computers is that computers in chess is that they're going to calculate much, much deeper. And it's all going to be about great tactical calculation and uh, so on and so forth. And and a couple of ways in which I think people were surprised is that number one, what happened earlier was that it didn't homogenize everybody's play as people expected. It took it in the opposite direction. If anything, the principles laid out by the Soviet school of chess were a sort of a homogenous way of playing. And computers allowed you to find concrete exceptions to broad principles and those became a competitive advantage. So, you know, th that generation which came which learnt on stockfish like Wesley So and so on are just so different in terms all of, of their them. thinking. All from of them, all of them. And the, they are all very, they all have very, very individual playing styles. If you look at the top 20 in the world right now, you cannot slot them into any one or even into any separate bucket. They're all very good at what they do, but they do it differently. And they obviously think differently about the game. And that's for sure. And and the second revelation was, uh, which I realized after Alpha Zero is that, you know, we had at least developed a set of heuristics which were broadly correct. That, you know, you go to initiative is important and therefore you develop your pieces. Space is important. So the center is important unless you're being hypermodern and trying to control it from the, the thing. But it was almost as if by playing itself over 24 hours, Alpha Zero actually played itself to a more nuanced set of heuristics, um, uh, like the, the relationship between initiative and material in the long term changed completely. And that leads me to asking a broader question about AI in general, because I think these sort of two generalized assumptions which people would have made about computers within chess did not hold true for this. And I don't think they hold true for anything. We often make a lot of simplistic assumptions about computers, of about AI in terms of what it I is good at. I think we're already seeing that uh, with the large language models. 
the fact that they seem to be able to do an enormous range of tasks which they were not expected to be able to do. I mean, no one created LLMs saying that, you know, this will help me code. But they can actually code. They can actually solve a lot of mathematical problems. They can... I can see situations where... Uh, see, generative AI is always going to be a funny thing because the other thing I think which people... There are two things about AIs which I think people are underestimating. One is... Um, the first has been talked about. The second actually has not been talked about much. The first is you have biases baked into Indian, uh, into human society. Our assumptions about, and I mean not just assumptions about color and gender, but assumptions about who you should give a mortgage to. Uh, those uh, are baked into the system. Also, assumptions in criminal justice about who is more likely to backslide and be a, whatever they call it, a recidivist criminal or whatever, again, baked into a thing. AI trains ultimately on this material. You might try to clean up the material, but it is still training on this material. And those assumptions that are already, they are baked in so deep that you cannot get them out. You know, if you, um, if you tell an AI, look at people working in STEM, it's going to say, well, women don't work in STEM. And, and that is unfortunately a fact. I, I mean, uh, there are far fewer women working in STEM than there are men. And if it takes that as a basis for judging who you should give scholarships to, then you, you're going to perpetrate the bias. This, okay, people have actually talked about this, but how to deal with it on a gigantic scale is a different matter. The other thing that has not been talked about with AI is that we're already on the road to a certain kind of slavery. And this is not slavery to AI. It is slavery to to organizations using AI. I will try to explain this. AI need data. One of the easiest ways to get data of the kind that all AIs need is get a bunch of people or a bunch of monkeys or whatever, give them cameras, tell them go out, take pictures of whatever, guitars, trees, houses, label the cap uh, picture by voice, pair versus tree, etc. AI crunches the data, gets to know what a tree looks like, gets to know the Hindi, Odia, in uh, Spanish and English word for a tree, how that sounds. And it's jumped to level in terms of training. You might be using this training to build a system that can run an auto-driven auto car. It knows what a tree is, it's less likely to hit it, etc. You might use this system for anything. But you've got this data, you have actually got a scenario where you can almost seamlessly translate from one language to another with enormous degree of fidelity and facility. And you're paying the monkey with the camera jack shit. You're paying the monkey with the camera, you know, 50 rupees an hour for his work and you're selling it up the line at $500 an hour, the data he's giving it. So you've got a scenario where cyber coolism of a different kind is happening 
in the bangalore scenario where you were using a programmer out of bangalore yes you were using a labor arbitrage thing where you were paying the man a lot less than you would pay an equivalent uh, american but here you're talking about exploitation at a level which is insane if you think about it you can i know people who are actually doing this you can hire an entire village in haryana or orissa uh, give them all a dirt cheap phone and a data connection and collect these pictures you're not even not you're not even breaking the man's privacy uh, it's non private data uh, and what you've got at the end is something of enormous value and you paid literally peanuts or less than peanuts for it and the people who have put that data together for you have no intellectual or monetary claim on what you do with it and they will eventually in other ways also get exploited because you will use the data and so it's a it could in my estimation lead to a well cyber colonialism or cyber coolism of a scale and a rate which hasn't happened even with normal with all the it also outsourcing that has occurred this would be a new paradigm and a new dimensional shift in many ways and it hasn't been talked about it has barely been written about at the science and business journal level and of course anybody who talks about it is also at risk of being labeled a communist or a mad left winger and i'm not any of those things i'm just saying that i think this is unfair because of the sheer differentials in terms of the value of the work being done versus what you're actually paying for it and i think this is dangerous because it's at a level of international relations it's going to lead to a situation or it is already trending towards a situation where there are certain countries in the world india venezuela brazil which will be exploited to the max by a few organizations which will lead perhaps to a change in world order of a you know of what is that flipping movie skynet terminator well not necessarily a hostile ai but a bunch of mnc's running ais uh well maybe neuromancer is a better example of the kind of world you're talking about or snow crash uh, you know a few a few mnc's running the world with a uh, a few countries at the bottom of the pile in terms of not being able to get even the crumbs from the table where that is concerned i'm going to push back a little bit and i'm going to say that this scenario is actually condescending to the people you're speaking on on behalf of in the sense that if there are people in a village who are being paid peanuts and far less than the value of the data that they collect to collect data the reason they are accepting that is, is because that it, it is, is a best than, option open to them it is a better option the, than the, the classic yeah. like, you know i i'd once Uh, admitted admitted uh, at 15 years ago no this is and i'll just elaborate on this a bit because 15 years ago i'd like i'd like written a column on child labor and it's very easy for elites to say oh we should ban child labor but oxfam 
once spoke about the situation in Bangladesh, where international outrage from elites like us made factories lay off 30,000 child workers. And you think, wow, we've gotten rid of child labor. Many of them starved to death, many became prostitutes. Yeah. There was a similar 1995 UNICEF study, which showed that, you know, there was an international boycott of carpets made in Nepal by elites like us Fair because go. child labor and more than 5,000 to 7,000 girls, Nepali girls, turned to prostitution because the best option Fair they had was Fair destroyed go. by the elites. I, 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 I get that side of the argument. Mm. I get that side of the argument and I'm, I'm admitting that 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 is, of course, why the labor arbitrage works. Because you are picking up a village where people don't have any other options and you're giving them what they consider a better deal than they could get. But I still feel very uncomfortable about this because I can see things developing out of this trend which are, if you like, fairly nasty and potentially tectonic shifts in world order. And it is, uh, if you like, similar to the scenarios where, you know, uh, people were asked to gather plants which they considered herbal medicinal plants which were then taken to a lab and then turned into IP by a pharmaceutical giant somewhere else which sold the drugs back at a huge markup. Yeah, but, but that, this that, that a, IP issue is a different matter this entirely. Is a, this but is on this, a scale which is much more gigantic. Yeah, I, w I would just feel that I feel that it's profoundly wrong to make judgment on people have it taking up the best option I'm, open to them. I'm not making a judgment about the people taking that option. I'm just saying that... No, even the MNCs. I think all of those MNCs are doing something incredibly virtuous by giving all of these people the an option just, for earning money which is better than any other option they currently have. It picking, is a social service. Uh, see, this is market meets supply and demand. MNC needs cheap data from wherever it can get it, the cheapest data it can get. Or for example, the Ukraine could, at the end of this war, become a great place for this, because you would have a highly educated profession which has no jobs, which has nothing, and who can, of course, use a smartphone to take pictures and label the pictures. I mean, I'm just objecting to terms like slavery and exploitation. I don't think that's what's happening here. What's happening here is empowerment, that people are given an option that is better than any other option open to them. And it, it, it's just wrong for elites sitting in a city to say, nay, nay, but the data is worth much more. Then give them a better job. You know, if that's the best do they have open to uh, them. Do you give them a better job or do you give them a long-term lien on the value of the data? Which is what I would look for, not necessarily about Sure, then that becomes uh, something that you can only do when companies are, when different MNCs are then competing for such data, and then that yes. could be one of the things yeah, you do in competition. Uh, the market, but market structure here is fascinating because it isn't easy to analyze the situation, and I'm, um, I'm aware of the argument you're making. It's one I have made many times. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm not. I'm not dissing that argument. I'm not coming here from an ideological angle. I'm coming here from uh, two things. One is deep discomfort with the sheer disparity in values. The sheer disparity in values is more than, much more than it is with uh, Pfizer taking a malarial herb and turning it more. The scale of the impact is a lot more. The potential change in world order. The fact that this might push you from being nation states with maybe a way up the ladder or down the ladder into a dystopian kind of snow crash or neuromancer-ish environment where the countries which are currently generating the data would be at the bottom of the pile. Couple of things. One is that one note is that, I said discomfort. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no sure. Not 
yeah yeah no um, my a uh, couple of reactions is that one i think that as long as it is a positive sum game i don't care about the disparity are both parties benefiting or not that's one angle to it i'm looking at the level of individuals of the individuals doing whatever the grunt work is whether it's cheap coding or collecting data or making carpets as long as it's a best option open to them and they are benefiting that's what i really care about and the other thing is that it is not that some countries will be at the bottom of the pile because you know people bring up this bogey man of inequality will increase which is absolute errant nonsense because what ai does and what all new technology does is it actually democratizes a field and empowers poor people i mean if you look at uh, the way poor indians all over the you know not just in ta- cities but towns and villages are empowered by technology like cheap uh, like ubiquitously cheap bandwidth right now for mm-hmm. example it's mind blowing to me it's a democratizing force today any every indian can use chat gpt or any of the generative ai mm-hmm. it is not just for the rich it is not just for people in rich countries and therefore someone anyone sitting here today anyone sitting in any village today can really innovate their way out of you know their social condition and their economic conditions so I, i i on the whole i feel enormously confident i do have a separate issue with how you know uh, like uh, my chief issue with a lot of this is that the disquieting move that i have seen in the last 10 years is that the wrong aspects of human nature can be amplified by big tech companies because of the technology o- uh, open to them for example i think the facebook like button and the twitter retweet button amplified Indeed. our instinct to yeah. tribalism polarized our discourse those are the things i worry about but i also think that those did not come about because the companies were evil they were maximizing mm-hmm. en- engagement this was a side effect and it is also possible to take it in the other direction like there is a reason i think reddit is much less toxic than twitter that discussions are better and it is simply because as we understand you know which aspects of human nature can be amplified in what ways i i think we'll also you know i'm well, a little more reddit optimistic. is a is an in itself a fascinating example because the trying to monetize it etc and the whole thing with which has happened with mods yeah. in reddit and so trip so yeah but okay let's i'm not disagreeing with your arguments i'm just saying that i think in this case scale makes a difference and my projection of the situation is that it will eventually lead to stress huge stresses in the world order and that is may or may not be a good thing and yes if you had to take one of the points you made if you had for argument's sake five different companies coming to the same villages and saying buddy do this for me for 25 bucks an hour versus 26 bucks an hour yeah you'd have an open market and uh, maybe that is the solution maybe you actually need you know the cabbage to stand up and say that all right we will pay you to do this for 26 bucks an hour why cabbage to stand up the cabbage meaning the man who is currently prime minister of india oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay first time i've heard him refer to uh, gobi ji huh? i've never heard him called gobi ji gobi ji yeah 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 okay okay now everything is falling into place and fool gobi ji is another yeah <laughs> aspect that we can bring into it. on that right yeah. out of uh, agreement which is you know mockery of our dear leader let's <laughs> take a quick commercial break and after that we'll come back and talk i we barely begun it you're going to be sitting here for another 10 hours uh, <laughs> listeners <laughs> enjoy <laughs> Have you always wanted to be a writer but never quite gotten down to it? Well, I'd love to help you. Since April 2020, I've enjoyed teaching 27 cohorts of my online course The Art of Clear Writing, and an online community has now sprung up of all my past students. We have workshops, a newsletter to showcase the work of students, and vibrant community interaction. In the course itself, through four webinars spread over four weekends, I share all I know about the craft and practice of clear writing. There are many exercises, much interaction, and a lovely and lively community at the end. 
of it. The course costs rupees ten thousand plus GST, or about a hundred and fifty dollars. If you're interested, head on over to register at IndiaUncut.com/clearwriting. That's IndiaUncut.com/clearwriting. Being a good writer doesn't require God-given talent; just the willingness to work hard and a clear idea of what you need to do to refine your skills. I can help you. Welcome back to the scene in the unseen. I'm chatting to Devang Shudatta, and in the break, you were telling me about you know Bengali commentary on Oppenheimer and so on. Kindly, kindly reproduce some. Well, uh, there is this. It's very colloquial Bengali, so it can't be reproduced in that sense. But essentially, there's this chap who's sort of spoken an open message to Nolan. Christopher Nolan saying, "Hey, you seem to have made this movie about a guy who built bombs. But let me tell you, Bengal building bombs is a cultural thing." <laughs> and do the Bengali? Am I there? Peto one hour at a oiti joache, something to that effect. And you know you should, and we make better bombs than anybody else. We're better. Our cottage industry of making bombs is better than anywhere else in the world. So maybe you should do a movie about Bengalis who make bombs. <laughs> well, Bengali bombshells are also um, quite a thing. L- let's sort of go back to your uh, chronological journey. Like I think I have the vague impression. I don't know if this is true, but I have the vague impression that you have been in prison in thirteen countries. But I, I have no idea if that is the case. But I do know you're widely travelled, and you've always got these incredible anecdotes about all these different places you've been to. So tell me a bit about this side of you. Like when did you start travelling? You became a shippy also for a while. What was that life like? Take me through your travels. What you learned. What you saw, the world was a very different place at that point of time, and much less in the way of paperwork. In fact, one of the things I deplore about the Indian government in the nineteen eighties is that it actively asked for visa regulations. For example, until the mid eighties, you could go to the to West Germany without a visa. You could go to Canada with a with a very easy visa, and then the uh, Indian government decided, no, no, Khalistanis will come and do various things. And of course, Khalistanis did various things. The visas didn't getting a visa didn't or not getting a visa didn't stop them. But they asked for these. Bilateral agreements where you would need a visa for a Canadian citizen to come to India and for a German to come to India and vice versa. So uh, a lot of the easy connections got cut off. Other than that, I wandered around, not being a very ambitious person and being more interested in experiences and meeting. And seeing peculiar things, than making large sums of money or having a regular job, I wandered around a fair amount. So, and the good thing with chess is that chess players are part of a sort of global guild. Uh, you can land up in any place where the game is played. Uh, just find a local club, uh, bash out a few games of blitz, and. You know, let it be known that you're looking for a place to sleep that night. Somebody or the other will cheerfully take you home, and give you a. You know, you can unroll your sleeping bag on the floor and hang out. And we've also done things like hit tournaments where you hit a motel and basically seven of you pack into a room. So, I mean, and pretend that there are just two of you there or something, but. So again, it was a easy, fairly footloose life, and this is nineteen eighties. Nineteen eighties, and even in highly authoritarian places like the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, this was a sort of uh, informal passport. Even the local cops played chess. They assume that if you were a chess player, you weren't very interested in anything else. You weren't a spy or something. 
And while it led to occasional hysterical experiences, as in, you know, you were just, uh, you didn't have an explanation for why you were in a place, except that you were playing chess. And uh, it also meant connecting with people at a personal level, which would probably not have been possible for a non-chess player. You would, you know, if you were going there on a delegation to discuss buying MiG-21s or something, you would have been part of that delegation and presumably had a translator who was also a minder chasing you around all the time. And you would have been living in a hotel, etc. Whereas a lot of what I did was you were basically hanging around in people's houses and um, you were just randomly enjoying yourself. And you also got to see the, I wouldn't necessarily say the underbelly of a place, but the senior side of places in many cases, which sort of gives you an insight into how a system really works. Not putting this very well, but let me put it this way. You have a country which is run by a government of some description. That government puts certain kinds of laws in in place and does what it can in the way of enforcing them. If you're looking at the senior side of that country, the people who are in the cracks and margins who are not necessarily government servants or uh, doing particularly interesting or exciting jobs, but who are also making a living one way or the other, quite often by doing criminal or quasi-criminal things, you get a reasonable sense of how the country works and whether the enforcement actually works or it doesn't work. Can you give me some examples? Ah, like I'm totally waiting for like exciting, salacious stories with names and places and details. Come on, man. See, we used to do things like trade soap and disposable needles into the Soviet Union mm -hmm. uh, at a personal level, I'm saying. And I have uh, swapped my pants. I mean just normal corduroy jeans for sex. Uh, so you also had this, for example, you had this wonderful thing where the rupee and the ruble were at one to one. The ruble and the dollar were officially at one to one. Unofficially, you could get 18, 20, rubles to the dollar if you sold on the black market. So it was a wonderful time for Indians because you could buy dollars officially using rupees in the Soviet Union and then sell them unofficially, which led to an instant huge boost in your uh, capacity to spend money on the street. Also for, I guess, a lot of um, Indians of my generation, it was one of the places where you didn't have racist barriers against Indians to a large extent. And you had a lot of attractive women, which you do in many other, I mean, every country has its attractive women. But you had a lot of attractive women who did not have a problem interacting with you, including intimately interacting with you. And uh, it was basically fun. I, I mean, I guess that is part of where my, you know, the Brahmo in me basically got buried for the uh, first time. Uh, or, you know, the burial of the Brahmo in me started that, okay, fine, you can 
I mean, sex is a wonderful experience, and yeah, why do you need labels like you must be married or you must be monogamous or what have you in order to have sex? So that was one level where. I mean, a lot of it was also very transactional. Like I'm saying that corduroy jeans. Corduroy jeans. How, how did that happen? How did the transaction suggest itself? Woman basically uh, said, "Can I take these?" And peacefully took her clothes off and peacefully tried them on and said, "Okay." I mean, they didn't fit perfectly, but you know, she could figure out. what to do to presumably to make them fit or oh, she didn't care i don't know so and that was it and so what was the transition like like i'm like imagine when you travel for the first time you're like a shy good bhalo manush bengali boy and then you have this awakening in different ways and i'm thinking that the most impactful way of this sexual awakening the most Im- the greatest impact would be on confidence that you become just a man of the world so to say and you you know no, what, uh, how did you uh, change my sexual awakening actually happened in manipur Oh okay uh, meaning i hit puberty while i was there and my first girlfriend per se was a manipuri mm. so i was i discovered i was interested in women uh, if that makes sense uh, i mean there's no mm. better way of putting it it's not as though i was uh, you know i was great at uh, picking up women or whatever but so i was certainly not a virgin when i traveled to when i started traveling so but and i had i didn't have a great deal of experience i don't think i still do but uh and uh, there was this i would reckon uh, the first time i slept with a woman abroad it would have been my fifth or sixth sexual encounter but uh no i i mean your where i think the difference happens is that a you're groping to figure out moles this is after all uh, you're talking about cultural differences and in places where you're not going to be for very long and where you don't know whether you're going to be clubbed to death or chucked in jail or whatever for <coughs> piling on to someone and uh, the other side of it is that uh, you learn to take no for an answer actually you you know if the woman says fuck off or no she is not interested or whatever you shrug and say good luck and move on that i think is one place where most indians really screw up very badly ego and entitlement get in the way ha huh, that uh, you go out and ask a woman whether she will dance with you have a drink with you go to bed with you and uh, if she says no you start getting unpleasant or you you do the asking by being physical which is in itself offensive where a lot of women are concerned so i guess my learning curve was really that i'm a well brought up bhalo manush bengali boy so i do not uh, you know i may leap upon women with glad cries but only after i am fairly sure that they have given me permission and uh, if a woman says she is not interested i will salute and move on and without any hard feelings so i guess i mean the big deal there is that i haven't been clubbed over the head or what have you i've had my share of good and bad sexual encounters i suppose but and like me you tend to geek out about things that you get sort of interested in whether it's chess or bridge or investing which we'll speak about later and military history and all of that and sex is one of the interest listed in your twitter bio so did you also geek out about sex and is there a danger in becoming what uh, paramita vora colorfully referred to as thinky like one of her slogans which i love is be kinky not thinky you know referring to men who overthink you know what what they're kind of doing so 
geek out yes but let's see there were two or three things happening at this point of time i'm uh, it's so a long... reference point i was chatting uh, i had breakfast today morning with uh, our mutual friend mohit satyanand and another person who's been a guest on the show akshay jetli and akshay mm-hmm. was telling us about one of his heroes is great the gentleman who invented uh, hi-fi i think mark levinson and mark mm-hmm. levinson married samantha of sex and the city and they together they wrote a book about the female orgasm now to me that is geeking out you know that you geek out to the extent that you've written a book about it so no look uh, when i was growing up uh, or a young adult not a young adult a young man young adult is generally used for that 14 to 18 or whatever i'm talking about your publishing hat on uh, whatever the, i'm talking about in my 20s and early 30s you didn't have huge amounts of i think literature on sex per se you had a lot of psychoanalytical babble some of which i read like with everyone else but and you had the you had the playboy and penthouse level of imaginary encounter or semi imaginary encounter or whatever you you had a fair amount of porn but also very vanilla vintage porn for want of a better word at that point of time and that i was in your too because it was always playing on the background somebody or the other had a porn tape on when you were floating around and you sort of took a look if it looked interesting you looked if it didn't you just ignored it and in that sense the other thing that started happening was that towards the end of this period the late 80s people had started getting terrified about aids so you were uh, everyone was consciously throttling back the geek out in the sense of you know there are 900 positions or whatever in the kama sutra or something no not beyond the point um i'm i'm willing to try lots of things but uh, you know not beyond the point and uh, i think what the you know in that sense the internet has democratized sex it has also democratize the ways in which porn actors can make money in a in a very healthy way in the sense that the whole concept of only fans and shooting your own video and you know taking a subscription or whatever all of that i think has made a huge difference to the industry second thing is uh, and this this i'm not sure what the reflections are but essentially you know if you've got a fetish about cigar smoking nuns someone on the internet has done something about it and what is more you can now ai it so yeah. you can get incredibly real looking porn with exactly the faces that you want uh, yeah. in any situation yeah so in that sense a my on the odd occasion when i'm you know you dive down the porn rabbit hole i did that last year when i was trying to write a piece on only fans versus porn hub mm. uh, uh one of the things which blew my mind was the sheer categorization and sub categorization of porn fetishes uh, fetishes probably not the right word here but you preferences know, preferences can you expand on that a bit it's very interesting see in my time i would have said okay it was either you have straight porn or you have gay porn or you have lesbian porn or you have you know some mixture of the three and maybe you have a threesome or an orgy now it would be sliced and diced into is this mature is this uh, you know is somebody using feathers is somebody using a dildo uh, 
you actually can i mean you can search for a wild uh, a very wide ranging variation on and only fans has more of those only fans i think has only fans has that insanity where uh, you know a lot of the stars over there basically have um subscription models yeah. where a subscriber says that i would love to see a scene which goes like this so another thing which has happened is the scenario building back in the 80s i remember very little porn which actually had a story i mean this sounds corny but in the sense that i remember one called uh, I've forgotten the name of the damn thing but the storyline was basically there is this great musician who is trying to write a symphony around the orgasm so he's wandering around trying to record orgasms which obviously means having orgasms then of course you had the classic uh, deep throat which was earlier but it was still very much available you had the devil in miss jones which is about young spinster who dies and she's in purgatory but she's not done anything bad but she's not done anything good and she has a vivid imagination so the devil says okay you can go back and do what you want for the next month or whatever and so she bongs her way through many things but you know by and large it, uh, there was no storyline i'm i'm sure this is still the case there is probably no storyline man meets woman or whatever woman meets woman and they wander out somewhere and they do various things but the only fan sort of thing is you know you have this thing where a subscriber says i say would you do a scene which goes like x y z scripts the what have you so there's this woman who's only fans uh, i mean i will confess that i don't think this is actually there is a huge gender divide over here there are far more women porn stars making a good living than there are guys i wouldn't want to even figure out why but so woman in question goes out and does this and you know it's much it's much more detailed in terms of so there's obviously somebody there who's got this very detailed fantasy and uh, it's much more detailed than anything which would have been out in that space in the 1980s or 1990s and you know you have again the ai thing coming in you can have uh, uh, you can dress your ai in bizarre fetish gear of all sorts of description so i think the whole slicing and dicing of porn that you know i want mm, pregnant blonde in uh, harem costume having it off with dracula uh, you you would actually get a lot of this and uh, the other thing is that i think uh, you've had an internationalization of porn in the sense that there are japanese porn stars who are now producing stuff on only fans using ai generated uh, translations of conversations etc etc which is again i i mean fine but it's bewildering because of the categorization sub category i'm sure if you if you get on to porn hub you know there there's like three rows of of what you can look for in terms of tags which in itself is uh, it's like the old thing they used to say that if you offer somebody a choice of four jams he can make up his mind but if you offer him a choice of 40 flavors of jam he's going to be confused pornhub is a they produce their own porn they're an aggregator it's an interesting story you have this bunch of canadians who met in college 
mostly from Middle Eastern backgrounds, Lebanese, I think, who put this thing together. It has an EU registration because EU is easier about this. Then they worked as an aggregator for a while, stood their way through a lot of court cases in various degrees about IP. Then they got hit by the underage thing, number one, and they got hit by multiple cases involving women who said they had been filmed when they didn't want to be or whatever. It's non-consensual. So they went through a cleanup where they dumped about 80-90% of their content because they couldn't be sure of either the, the age or the provenance in terms of thing. They have subsequently, I think, restructured the platform financially in some way. You have a lot of original content, including amateur content, but, well, I mean, technically all of this would be amateur in the sense that it's somebody who's filming in his or her bedroom. And they actually produce, you know, a fairly strong statistical database of where the uh, client, uh, where the viewers are coming from, and also which categories are popular. Uh, India is number four or five on that list, despite the fact that Pornhub is ban banned. Really banned, so a bunch of people using VPNs and. This is not even people using VPNs. The VPNites would show up as Something somewhere else. Oh. somewhere else. This is people who are cheerfully <laughs> getting. Pornhub has these uh, subdomains where mm. they change from .com to what have you. So this is some youth in Mirat who's, <laughs> who's figuring it out. Who's figuring it out. Mirat incidentally does a lot of porn. Oh. Yeah, Meerut has... Meerut used to be the capital of the very bad Hindi porn magazines, the... What were they called? Mastram, etc. Mm. Uh, and it has subsequently graduated to doing Desi porn. I've not been able to... But like, what's the revenue model? Where do they upload it? How do they get make money? The revenue model, this is actually, uh, as far as I can figure out, and uh, I haven't really been able to get a handle on this, this is actually closer to the old pawn uh, uh, revenue model. Guy basically pays a flat rate, 10k, 5k, whatever, to the actors, takes the thing, and then he markets it. And he sells you know, videos of it to various people, sells it on to various people. So it's almost old style. Then what happens is that, uh, see, obviously it gets stale and various people make copies of what is going on. So he produces some more. But it's a very, uh, it's a very cheap model in the sense that very little, if anything, is being paid on, uh, is being spent on the, production since the actors don't have options he, it also doesn't matter you know the man gets 2000 views he's happy or 5000 views he's happy and they're collecting 10 bucks 15 bucks kind of routine and at some stage i'm presuming some millimouth revenue official will hit it like a ton of bricks, but Meerut has been producing porn now for about four or five years. And, uh, you know, I cannot believe that it's flown under the radar. So presumably they, they've either figured out some way in which they can do it without getting busted or they're paying people off not to get busted.
And I'm really fascinated by the analog of this with the creator economy. Like one trend that I've seen in the creator economy is how the mainstream becomes more and more irrelevant. Creators have the means of production open to them and they can do things that no gatekeeper would ever allow like eight hour podcasts or whatever the case may be. Yeah. And the advantage of that is that not only does the mainstream often not cater to niches, it doesn't even know the niches are there, but individual creators can reach out and actually build a market for something that wasn't even there. Like, yeah. forget my long-form podcast, like 10 years ago, like, Long-form podcasts are the best kind of podcasts because people like Lex Friedman or Joe Rogan or whatever, there are so yeah. many long-form podcasts who are doing five, six, seven, eight hours today, although perhaps not eight like me. But, uh, you know, and I, I see only fans as an analog to that, that at, on the one hand, you may have a mainstream which is constrained by convention and its own imagination, but you have creators going out there trying interesting things, taking, you know, customization demands from uh, paying users, and it's like... the the long tail actually becoming, you know, a pun not mm. intended kind of situation. Mm. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it's, it broke the pawn industry model and has refashioned it in this way, which is at least in financial terms, a better deal for the creators. The creators. Mm. Again, how long this will last, I don't know, because you keep having issues where, you know, Visa refuses to uh, process OnlyFans revenues or what have you. So, and most countries, you're skating close to the law if you're making porn. There are very few places where it is completely legal to you know, to film porn and sell it. And uh, that part of it is unfortunate. I mean, and the other thing that I figured out in that one investigation, if you can call it, of OnlyFans and Pornhub, is that you need to draw a distinction between the sex worker who's even the high-end escort who is being paid to perform with the total stranger who is paying versus the actor in an only uh, fans sort of scenario or in a Pornhub scenario who is, for want of a better word, scripting a movie. I mean, the script may not be terribly imaginative when it may be very narrow focus, but somebody who is scripting a movie and... They have agency, they're empowered. Yes, and they're doing it with people they do not have a problem doing it with. I mean, and uh, at some level, uh, the customer remains anonymous, but it's not the customer who's participating in the exercise, so to speak. And some of it, I simply didn't get beyond the first layer because it would have involved signing up and paying for a lot of stuff, you know, the whole routine where many of them do this thing of, okay, I'm doing a live show. But, and I have no idea how a lot of that works. I mean, I have an idea of the financial model. I have no idea how a lot of that works. The, I think sex in general, or selling sex in general, is has always been cutting edge technologically. I mean, within weeks of the Gutenberg printing press, being up and running, there were people trying to figure out how they could, you know, do dirty pictures or what have you on it. Woodcuts, transfer woodcuts to what have you. So, and that trend just continues. Imagine taking woodcuts with you to the toilet for a private <laughs> moment. With the, So, here's a question for you, a broader question, that do you think the 
and, and these two have really happened simultaneously the growing the, the 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 current ubiquity of porn and the easy access plus the sort of the ubiquity of dating apps as well and the way men and women meet mm. and hook up and interact with each other and the fact that both of those in a sense either commoditize sex or make it transactional or at least separate it out from a sort of the courting process you know separate out love and lust as it were and e- and it's always been an uneasy relationship between mm. love and lust in any case do you think that has kind of changed the way men and women relate to it um you know what are uh sort of your uh, uh, thoughts on the changes that you've seen i'd say that somebody who grew up in this native atmosphere the 20 year old or the 25 year old would probably see it as natural that fine you're looking for somebody you have this vague sense of what your categorization is and you go out on a dating lab amp and bang it in or you go to Pornhub and you fill in the tags or whatever. Mm. For an earlier generation, I think that can possibly be a greater level of discomfort with the whole thing. But where i'd be interested really is figuring out what happens if you're from a conservative indian family with an arranged marriage in the future or what your parents assume will be an arranged marriage in the future and you've been on a dating app and so has your putative uh, potential partners or partner you'd actually probably throw in the sexual compatibility thing you know when you take a look at each other in a way that you wouldn't have in an earlier generation in an earlier generation your parents in the in that kind of uh, atmosphere your parents would have decided all right ladki achhi hai ya whatever mm, in this the next progression was all right ladka and ladki can meet at some um you know carefully curated dinner or coffee date where they discuss stuff in my generation a couple of my friends went through that particular loop and you know it was more like saying that hey you know i smoke grass please don't ask me to stop smoking grass <laughs> <laughs> with woman scratching her head and saying okay what is grass what is grass as the case may be and uh, now i think that particular meeting would possibly be far more transactional that do you do this 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 and do i do this this then this and actually the other thing here which i would like to take on board is I remember talking to a mutual friend Vikram about the gay dating scene and he was the first one who tipped me off to this that the fact that the LGBTQ community is far more upfront where it comes to discussing what they will and will not do before they actually get into a relationship and which can very from you know the base level of all right i will or will not have penetrative sex to very complicated things like i will wear a halloween costume mm-hmm. i mean variations on what halloween costume you will wear i want to get you drunk and ask you about your kinks but <laughs> never mind <laughs> I've been a good boy. Cigar smoking nuns, Halloween costumes. Yeah. <laughs> the Halloween costume thing, I used to know this Gujarati gent who supplied fetish costumes. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was an amazing but, thing. Uh, in India, but why would no, Halloween no. Achha, uh, somewhere no, else? Uh, mm. No, no. Uh, globally. Mm. It was like he had a cousin who had a playboy connection as in used to supply stationery or candles or whatever to playboy i'm talking again of the late 1980s early 90s 
And cousin in question, having seen Playboy used to send out these catalogs of Halloween costumes. I mean, you want Wonder Woman or you want whatever. <laughs> and the uh, cousin in question, being a good guju with a good business, knows that I have cousin in Ahmedabad who will make this 10% cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you had, you know, chap in Ahmedabad who didn't know, didn't care. You gave him a namuna and you said, you, I want costume which looks like this. He would give namuna to his master tailor and cutter who would just make it. And of course, he was, he grabbed the market because, you know, he could undercut everybody because of the labor I have a dirty right? slogan for this I don't know if I should say this in the show but then the costume would go from master tailor to masturbator <laughs> <laughs> apologies to all my listeners my image has crashed in front of their eyes absolutely but you know I, I, I mean the world was an amazing place actually the other thing I've always found amazing about I mean the world was Sardar Patel airport had a cough cafeteria cum bookshop which had the best collection of uh, LGBT erotica, not porn as in books about LGBT relationships etc. that I have seen in India and I would got friendly with the father and daughter combo that ran that place this is early 2000s when I was in and out of Ahmedabad twice a week on a project. I got friendly with them and uh, so I asked that how come and the thing was that Ahmedabad did not have a place for LGBT people to meet. And this was in the part of the airport where you could buy a visitor's entry ticket for 50 bucks and go in. So this was a good place for them to meet. So you bought your entry ticket, you went in, you stood in front of the bookshelf with the LGBT material and said Kem Cho to anybody else who came along and stood in front of it. <laughs> Kem Cho, uh, again. <laughs> Oh, whatever the, you know, the Guju equivalent of a pickup line is. And uh, you, uh, so sound business principles, you put together a shelf or two of LGBT literature. And, and you know, thinking about it now, it actually makes complete sense that LGBT people would have complete honesty and openness in terms mm -hmm. of sex and be able to be transactional about it and honest about it and talk about it because for them... While falling in love. While falling in love because for them it would not be tied up with all the social taboos and dogmas mm -hmm. that are there in mm -hmm. heterosexual relationships mm -hmm. and all that. Not talk of love shove would also not be there. Marriage mm -hmm. marriage would not be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if it's not going to work out at that very basic level, then it's probably yeah. the love shove and the rest of it will not work out. I think maybe for a lot of people, uh, at least anecdotally, I've hit the age where, you know, large, num we have a large number of divorced acquaintances and you know that marriages have gone bust for random reasons, but this is a fairly uh, important one, the complete, I mean, lack of compatibility at some, sexual level. at the sexual level, which is often not, in the Indian context, I suspect, at least in my generation, it was largely people being unaware even that they had a incompatibility. That, you know, the, the whole thing was glossed over that, Achha, huh, you will get married, you will have children. The hows and wheres of you will have children and one of you actually likes doing this and the other doesn't, or both of you don't, as the case may be, is something that I suspect a lot of people simply didn't know about themselves until they actively, you know, they were married and... Mm, trying to do whatever and then they figured out that okay this is 
maybe not going to work out and maybe a lot of unhappiness about this do you think the institution of marriage it is itself archaic at a couple of levels one level being that in india especially it can be an incredibly toxic institution especially for the women i mean unless you're privileged it pretty much ends the life of any woman who gets into it and um, and the men and women tend to be trapped in roles and expectations you know which kind of get ossified and it can you know just be Uh, an incredible problem as people live lives of quiet desperation to use Thoreau's phrase though he didn't mean marriage specifically of course and and the other one is that once you sort of begin to desegregate the many components so what was supposed to be contained in marriage whether it is sex or companionship or friendship or uh, falling in love then f- for a lot of uh, reasons it, it may not even kind of seem necessary like in today's society sure if you want to have kids and yeah maybe you get married for the sake There of the kids but two things on the checklist where you need some institution like marriage not necessarily what we have at the moment this would be my opinion one is the checklist on inheritance because uh marriage is a shortcut uh, if you're not married you actively need to make a will in order to leave whatever you may possess possess in the way of property etc and second uh, in the again in the indian context this is not so applicable globally anymore you need to uh, if your kids are out of wedlock and you're not living together they have an enormous problem in terms of the other listing and the for the calculations on inheritance etc i mean both the spouse as well as the children spouse or partner as well as the children so you need in my estimate some sort of short hand or short cut to this it doesn't necessarily have to be marriage but then you've got the lgbt case up there at the moment and i think that itself forcing the supreme court to think about this is in itself useful even if the supreme court does nothing about it and there's an inherent absurdity here in the law a multiple murderer who's on death row and likely to be uh executed tomorrow can choose to get married provided the partner is of the opposite gender mm. at the same time a perfectly good citizen who has never committed any crime paid all his or her taxes and what have you cannot if the partner is of the same gender and the justification for one is that there's a tacit acceptance that okay if you have assets or property of a certain description and it isn't you know you wish to leave it to somebody you should be allowed to do so which should apply even more in the other case and i don't know whether given this country's lunacy is and the determination to try and put in a uniform civil code in a place which is as diverse as india i don't know whether you'll ever actually address this problem or in our lifetimes address this problem but i think yes marriage as an institution is probably archaic but it is shorthand for something which you do need which is the next of kin the the financial and legal implications of and and also like our education system i guess it's an equilibria we are stuck in it may not fit we may need to reform it but we are stuck and as far as lgbt marriage is concerned you know like our mutual friend vikram had once 
given me a lot of dope which uh, i i wrote a column called the matunga racket which i'll link from the show notes about what used to happen when 377 was criminal and gay sex was crim- criminal uh, and you know a- as recently as 15 years back you imagine that if it was ever decriminalized there would be an uproar against it but on the contrary to our delight when it was decriminalized most people were completely fine with it yeah. the uproar i would have expected 20 years ago didn't happen which indicates that social attitudes have really changed and i think at least on these margins social attitudes are kind of progressing i mean that, that's uh, my I optimism have a slightly different take i don't think the socially conservative indian really cares who somebody is sleeping with they care about who somebody is socially associated with and the caste levels in cases of marriage and uh interreligious yes the inheritance and the marriage and the interreligious thing i don't think uh, the socially conservative indian really cares who somebody is sleeping with and whether the, you know the gender of that person or even the caste of that person so long as on the surface you are married to somebody of the opposite gender and the right religion and the right caste i don't think they give a fuck the flip side of this is when people have including friends of mine who have surrogate children when they've gone through the surrogacy routine families have said you must make sure that the mother is of the right caste and etc etc and you know so i don't know whether it's progressive or whether it's indifference but yes the fact that there wasn't a lot of screaming about 377 being repealed is a good idea there has been a lot of anecdotally since the people who um filed that case are friends of mine one of them is a colleague anecdotally there has been a lot of resistance to the idea that uh, people of the same gender can get married and that boils back turns back to the inheritance factor well i mean again going back to paradigm changing one funeral at a time soon may they die yeah. Yeah. and may we be kind of rid of this kind of opposition yeah i mean there again i mean you're talking about you know the at one level in haryana in the cop scenario if you have the same gotra as someone else getting married to them is like a death sentence the cops will kill you if you go into conservative tamil society there are high castes uh, where it is common to pass the parcel in the sense that two families decide that all right we are in the, on the same page in terms of caste and gotra so you have one marriage then if you have a daughter from that marriage the daughter from that marriage marries somebody from the mother's family often the mother's brother so her mama um and the concept here is that fine party a has paid dowry in the first marriage party b returns the dowry in the second marriage and this can go on for generations so, and of course gotra compatibilities etc at some stage uh, it's obviously not important in that particular hisab or it has been sorted in the first stage and you have a lot of tribal communities where which are nominally at least some of them are nominally hindu where i don't think this concept the concept of marriage as we see it in the in the north indian conservative society isn't really the same meghalaya large proportions of the tribes inheritance the f- the youngest daughter is the primary inheritor 
of property kind of thing and i mean it's common enough for kasi uh children to take their mother's name as their surname which would be unheard of in and um if you're going to look at this diversity i'm pretty sure that you know a lot of communities might not might really not care which is fine that's the ultimate in liberalism if you like you don't care how somebody else is living their life so long as they do it you know with consent and without bothering you for the others i think there there would be yeah whether it's a legacy or whatever marriage is something everybody understands i mean i i've seen bizarreness one of my friends in calcutta been divorced for several years the police suddenly landed up at his place with an arrest warrant for his ex-wife because that was the last known address kind of thing so what was the loop she was supposed she supposedly kidnapped a couple of kids given that you know this is she actually makes noodles for a living mm-hmm. given that uh, she had uh, she isn't a career kidnapper loop was that the kids in question were the children of a divorce where father did not have custody rights however he had cunningly picked up both the kids and he was in a relationship with this lady and the cops could not file kidnap charges against the father because brain ex- head explodes at the thought of <laughs> but so they filed it against her mm, so you have absurdities like this one of my cousins who is a school mom says that over the last 10 to 15 years they have actually started dealing with this sort of situation where you know you've had a acrimonious divorce where one parent is not allowed to even see the children or can only see them in a supervised situation kind of thing and they've had to deal with that but the point is that people understand marriage they understand divorce they understand inheritance by this so if you're chucking it out you have actually have to put a a um, whole new system which may well be better i'm not i mean i, I it could well be better but uh, you actually have to put in a new system this is a classic example of india inhabiting many centuries at the same time the gotra compatibility of the 19th century yeah. and the halloween costume of the 21st century yeah and long may the halloween costume live though well uh, people have i've been to a not a halloween but a holy party evening where everybody was stoned on bhang where people were wearing such outfits and i was told that you should come as a pirate and i said fuck off but your great great grandfather was a river pirate yes but that but he it's liked, your heritage it's your sanskar yeah but my great grandfather wore a dhoti while being a river pilot so you should wear a dhoti and say i've come as a pirate <laughs> <laughs> so which would but you know there were a lot of uh, people there who were wearing ridiculous things uh, i mean uh, if something is ridiculous if it turns them on that is absolutely fine but you know they were wearing absurd costumes so i guess holy and halloween have so yeah. <laughs> holyween holyween costumes holyween costumes and and i'm sure that if you look for it now uh, in fact i will make a note of this i must try and figure out how much in the way of fetish costumes you can buy in india or amazon i'm sure yeah really must be be kinky don't be thinky let's uh, let, let's go back to talking about your life i uh, give me now a sort of a 
chronological sense of where are you and what are you doing because what i have learned is that in your teens you're playing a lot of chess and at some point you're traveling through europe and uh, continuing the sexual awakening that began in uh, <laughs> manipur when you hit puberty but quite apart from the question of sexual awakenings like what are the subjects you're really interested in what are you thinking of doing as a living you you know you were a shippy for a while how did you get into that how did you meander your way out of that into journalism give, give, give me a, you know that that kind of narrative it's an inherently fucked up profession you tend to have long periods when you don't have a contract why did you become a shippy though like what were the options in front of you and why did you say ki nahi yaar mujhe sailing karna hai and so far as i thought about it it was basically quick money and for a young man easy money and i was i like the thought of seeing um, exotic places the long periods it's a very cyclical industry the long periods when things go for a toss so one of the one of my semi skills was the ability to fiddle with programming and figure out how computers work uh this had very little to do with shipping but so also because of the long layoffs etc at various points of time i had studied various subjects so now early 90s i was playing a tournament in pune and bumped into a friend of mine who is a, was a stock broker and investment banker later who said uh, vaguely that i remember you used to be okay with computers so i said yeah what where so his company had just bought a shitload of what at that time was high highly expensive high end computers and trading and financial analysis programs and they didn't have a clue about how to run this stuff or to make sense of it or to integrate it with indian data as was available there so this is just before the harshad bhai boom took off etc i was at a loose end i went in i figured out how to reverse engineer these programs to the point where you were getting cyclo style data from the stock exchanges but typist could type that in and you could basically run these programs and get some sort of results along the way i figured out that um, i can write coherent sentences i had often on been writing about travel and chess and stuff like that from the early 80s so 92 93ish they were firangis getting into the game trying to get into the indian market everybody was writing reports most of the people who were writing reports couldn't string two coherent sentences together so i moved up the ladder to somebody who was writing reports then around 96 somebody i was very close to was in delhi was in the process of dying of cancer so i was looking for some reason to be in delhi at this point uh, tony joseph who had carried some stuff that i'd written offered me a job so i took the job this was at business world this was at business standard mm-hmm. oh he was there he was handling both at that point of time i was also writing for bw world basically this was at business standard so i ended up being a full time journalist for a couple of years 
after which uh, when shit started hitting the fan in the media business i went freelance but i i continue to write for business standard and to do a certain amount of work for a couple of other journalistic setups do for a couple of trade magazines in the finance and infrastructure space mm-hmm. telecom and infrastructure financing etc and once in a while i used to edit manuscripts this part of it was so uh, essentially you could call me a an expert editor of a certain kind of manuscript meaning non fiction popular economics investment that kind of stuff um so i've done quite a few of these then about uh, a year and a half ago two years ago uh, jagannath chiki offered me a regular gig doing this so I'm, i mean i'm doing it in a more regular fashion now which is also meant to insights into other things about the publishing industry which i frankly didn't know you know its processes how it tends to work where its pain points are if you like and i mean hidebound is a word which comes straight out of publishing and the industry has a huge problem there but uh, tell me about it it's not been able to capitalize on the digitization of all these processes and the fact that you know you can deliver any manuscript turn it around in a couple of days as a result of which amazon has eaten its lunch and the ridiculous thing here is that uh, books are a huge branding thing for amazon and amazon is a monopolist where it comes to ebooks but it's a tiny fraction of the turnover so they don't even care about it and these guys the domain experts the publishing houses have never been able to make sense of the business or to put it together in a way where they could potentially challenge amazon even though there's an obvious opportunity there um, there's several obvious obvious opportunities there the other thing is you you've had a serious problem in the sense that you've had say for example someone like colin hoover who's sold more books than uh, stephen king and sydney sheldon combined who was self published until book 3 or book 5 or whatever and who's basically a middle-aged housewife who lives in a small town in texas and writes you know why my romances i mean i've got nothing against her she's not not a terrible writer or anything like that but yeah so she managed to build a brand all on her own which went mega i can't think of a single publisher anywhere in the world who has managed to do that for any author which means that to my mind it means that you have a huge problem in terms of publishers not getting the medium if you've had ebooks around for 20 years approximately Mm. you've seen amazon eat your lunch breakfast dinner you've seen who was not the only one there are others who have managed to do things like this but 
mostly in niche areas. There are a few science fiction guys, there are a few mm, romance types, what have you. Mm. You don't have a single mainstream publisher who's managed to write the medium, build either an individual brand or to challenge Amazon in terms of produce a, provide a better platform, provide an alternate to the Kindle, etc. And as a result, you're still stuck in a business where a whole pile of these guys are, you know, you're printing a physical edition, hoping, taking on those enormous extra overheads involved in printing a physical edition. I mean, what does an e-edition cost in, if you remove the fact that you have to typeset, send it out for pages and then push it out into a physical distribution system, which is crazy. And where your returns come in dribs and drabs over a period of months that instead of that, none of them have been able to use the ebook advantage. Couple of questions. Mm -hmm. You said there are obvious opportunities they've missed. What are those? What are they specifically missing? Like, what are publishers doing wrong and uh, that others are doing right? And also, is ebooks a whole game? Because I remember vaguely when I did an old episode, one of my favorite episodes, in fact, with Kartika on publishing, she pointed out that, look, ebook sales kind of plateaued at a particular point in time. We thought they'll take over the world. They didn't. It's still printed books which are, you know, getting the job done. So what are the obvious opportunities that the publishers are missing? And, you know, uh, you know what can they do differently? And you are now a publisher yourself. So, what stops you? Uh, with me personally, it's beyond my pay grade. Sure. And I don't, I mean, I lack both the expertise at the nuts and bolts of these processes, as well as the interest to Fair chase it down and get going. In terms of opportunities I missed, it isn't just that ebooks have plateaued. Amazon is also your go to distributor for physical books. I mean, you are probably seeing Amazon as one single channel plus, you know, your 20 retail outlets when you're selling a book. You haven't been able to do that particular thing, whatever that involves, which is also to take over your own physical book distribution. I mean, you haven't been able to even put together an industry-wide initiative where you're looking. I mean, if you talk to any publisher, they will complain about Amazon, about different aspects of the Amazon thing you haven't been able to put together a, an aggregator where you talk to let's say a consortium of five publishers who decide that okay fine we'll put together a physical distribution system as the case may be and i think part of what kartika is saying is with the greatest of respect because she's amazing and she knows a lot more about the industry than I do. But uh, I think part of it is a tail wagging the dog thing. Ebooks have plateaued at a certain point because publishers have not been able to push the distribution. Part of it may be a legacy issue in that mm, maybe people like not you and me, but a lot of people our age who are readers prefer a physical book. I don't know. For my part, me personally, unless it is a graphic novel, I would much prefer the Kindle version. Or, uh, I mean, or I'm going on a trip 
where I know that I will have connectivity and power issues or something. I always, uh, right now, I mean, I've got a physical chess magazine with me. It's in the bag because at some stage I might be on a flight or on the metro and I will read it without, you know, having to worry about can I get on the internet. I haven't seen a chess magazine since uh, early 90s. You must show this to me after our recording. Yeah, yeah. This is new in chess, which is uh, the... I mean, but you get it in India. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I have one of those digital plus physical subscriptions, and I, I mean, basically, I hit the digital far more than the physical, if that makes sense. Isn't a physical chess magazine incredibly outdated? Because I mean, you can't click on shit and go further and blah blah blah. Yeah, that's that is true to an extent, but. And then again, this is for guys like me who don't have a problem reading a game and, uh, I mean... The pleasure of browsing and holding it in your hand. I mean, the browsing of physical places, magazine. Places where uh, I don't necessarily have mm. uh, the net and uh, where... Uh, I mean, I don't have a problem seeing, a, uh, I mean, blind reading a game. So, uh, I'm comfortable with that. But it is a digital plus physical edition. So, I mean, I also have it on my mobile. And uh, I mean, I can access it. And what I tend to do is download sections and um, use the analytical tools and uh, let it go. But uh, yeah, I mean, I also carry a magazine in the and you know, I would carry a book, I would carry a magazine. If I'm wandering around in places where net access may not be convenient or I can't get on the Kindle for whatever reasons. But uh, per se, my preference, except with a graphic novel, would tend to be an, an e-format rather than a... It is so much easier, even if you're... You just want to bookmark a sentence which you will think about later. It is so much easier if it's any format. But uh, there are also issues here in the sense that they haven't been able to push the publishers have not been able to push mainstream media to review books more often. Apart from a very few old-time newspapers and magazines which have book review sections, practically speaking, mainstream media does not cover books. There are very few outlets where mainstream media does serious book reviews, etc. You have a bloggers and Goodreads ecosystem which is in many respects just plain poisonous. Really? Uh, yeah, what tends to happen on Goodreads is either you have the author trying to game the system by getting friends and whatnot to come up with good reviews, or you have uh, somebody who hates the author trying to poison the system by coming up with bad reviews. So. Again, these are channels which I think publishers in general have not been able to understand the medium because if you don't understand the medium here, you cannot make the medium work for you. They have actually got into this game of looking for bloggers and influencers, but there again, you need to be less hit and miss. It's comparatively easier if you're handling non-fiction of a certain description because you will find influencer bloggers who are in that bandwidth. But uh, if you're talking about fiction, you very frequently just end up with, you know, the five people on Goodreads who would 
necessarily look at the book and who are not necessarily very incisive or perceptive, they're just very high volume. Anyway, this is me talking as an industry newbie, but and a reader, yeah, and a reader, yes. Uh, I mean, but as a reader, these these are not considerations which I had come uh, thought my way through. You know, like to take the obvious analogy. I mean, I've been listening to music since forever, and. I'm, Heard seventy-eight records. I've heard thirty-three and one-third records. I've listened to cassettes. I've listened to digital music of sundry description. I've never really thought about, you know, what constraints the medium in- imposes and how you can handle that. And of course, music has also had to handle that dis- disruption and, you know, the Napster kind of blew away phenomenon. And, uh, well, it seems to have survived. Now, as I'm not an industry insider. I don't know how exactly it has survived, but I know a few musicians, including uh, who seem to be reasonably happy about the way the industry is now proceeding. And I, I think that there are holes in the way publishing works, quite seriously. I should tell our listeners that when uh, Didi said, uh, including his thumb was towards a booth where our friend Omurto Ghosh is uh, sort of sitting and looking over the recording, fine musician, I shall, uh, from the show notes, I'll link to Omurto's Spotify page or whatever you want me to link to, kindly check it out and the, the thing with music what um I, I i sort of hear from people is that the, ch- the the changed imperatives is forcing a new kind of music in the sense that chuck gopal and an episode i did with him once told me that uh spotify starts paying musicians after 30 seconds are heard that is a minimum so there was some beatles cover band that covered every beatles songs in 35 seconds because they just wanted to hit that mark similarly uh, all the mainstream labels will now put pressure on their artists that i don't care what the song is but i need that 15 second hook that can go on instagram reels or tiktok or whatever these incentives take you in a bad direction but but a better direction could perhaps be that musicians like creators, I guess, can build audiences of their own on YouTube, do live streams, do whatever. But I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know how the I ecosystem say, I, works. I don't know how the ecosystem works. All I'm saying is that from the outside and from the few musicians I do know, I mean, I mean I'm friendly with the Indian Ocean gang, for example, they seem to be comfortable. Mm-hmm. Or they seem to... Maybe musicians had more agency as creators anyway and maybe they uh, adapted faster to it because inherently music has always been forced to use technology in a way that uh, publishing did not for many years i just feel optimistic that creators of all sorts will always get by including writers but publishers as intermediate the intermediaries keep keep changing and they need to adapt to changing times and publishing should really disrupt itself if it cannot uh, i know. think it will end up having to disrupt itself because what it has done is made organic changes when it's been forced on publishing in the sense that yes every book pretty much will have an e-edition kind of because of the i mean for the obvious reasons but uh, i don't think they have realized how to do this and look uh, the process differences are just plain stark as in to edit a book and turn it around in the digital version takes maybe a third of the time that it takes, or maybe a fourth of the time that it takes for you to print a paper copy and get that out through your channels to, you know, the ultimate reader. From the point at which an author submits a manuscript, to the point at which you can buy the book mm, at the airport 
let's say, is a solid one and a half, two month period, which is imposed by <coughs> physical constraints. I mean, it's not that the industry is working inefficiently, it's simply that that process is uh, inefficient beyond that point. And um, like I said, I think there is a tail wagging the dog effect here if ebook sales are plateaued. Mm, publishers don't know how to drag people from one format into the other or to simply do it. For all you know, all it would take would be for you to start selling your ebooks at a 50% discount. I don't know. Michael Crichton had a great uh, phrase for this uh, tail wagging the dog effect and he called it wet streets cause rain. You know, when the causation is the other way around. So what mm-hmm. you're saying is it's not that publishers uh, are not doing ebooks because ebooks don't sell, but on the other hand, they haven't put enough into selling ebooks. And if they did, perhaps, uh, you know, that would be a mm. bigger way forward. Yeah, but um, I'm a newbie to the industry and I don't necessarily understand it well enough to make this judgment call i'm telling you dd it's time for you to be an entrepreneur i want my next episode with you to be four years later when you told me how you sold your publishing startup for a billion dollars totally waiting for that let's talk about the other thing for which you are almost legendary in in our common circles which is investing you know how did you uh, and you're a quant i believe so i'll ask, I'll, I'll kind of ask you to explain how you got into investing your philosophy towards investing how your journey has been through the years i've had my ups and downs i am a quant in the sense that i would follow the data and the numbers far more than the human beings in the indian context which is essentially where i have focus most of the time, you cannot be an honest businessman. The environment is so fucked up in terms of legal and regulatory compliances and deliberately fucked up. It's, um, you have a bunch of corrupt people making complicated laws in order to trip up businesses, in order to force businesses to come up with money under the table. If you have to come up with money under the table, you have to be dishonest yourself in the way you run your business. I once did a YouTube video on how to generate black money. Um, so It's still there. We'll link it. In the I have no idea. We must find it. Really. Yeah, for one of those TEDx things. <laughs> anyway, must find it. It was it was a long time ago. There are other methods of doing this now, but anyway, so we must do a new video. So a lot of people will go through this bullshit about you must look for honest and competent managements. Competent managements, yes, honest in the Indian context, there isn't. They don't exist. Second. Uh, if the numbers don't make sense to you, uh, you probably should not be buying a company. Third, your investment needs are different buckets. You have some long-term needs and goals and what have you, which is realistically different from trying to turn around a 30% return in two months. And it's okay to be doing both. But you need to keep them separate in your heads. That this is my long-term bucket. This is my... You can have a long-term bucket, which is all right. If I live to 80, I will need money. You can have a second long-term bucket, which is... There is this kid I have to send to college, so I will need 50 lakh or a crore or whatever on this specific date or at this specific time. Uh, say in 27, 2027 or something, I will need this money for the next three years, over the next three years. And uh, you have other long-term needs, which is at some stage you will want to buy a house or a car or something, and you want 
mad money for that specific purpose. So these are completely different from each other in the way ways in which you would structure investments or the kinds of investments you look at. And they're also completely different from trading. And there's a technology has made a difference to the way I would trade. Twenty five years ago I would get into arbitrage type trades that there is a problem where I could potentially make, you know, 1% return in a one day period kind of thing. Those opportunities don't exist anymore. The computers have taken them out of the game. You have some trends in the market which are pretty common in terms of industry cycles. You have other trends in the market which are behaviorally common as in there are periods when IPOs do well and there are periods when IPOs do badly. And uh, if you can identify those things, you can make a reasonable return. One of the very, very key questions for a guy like me, and this is also because as far as I'm concerned, investment is the same as betting on a horse race or in a casino, even on my ability as a chess player or while playing bridge. The risk of ruin and the amount of money you can, risk of ruin meaning how fast can you run through your entire corpus and the amount of money you can afford to lose on a certain transaction are the two things you really need to work out before you get into investing and trading. If you're not going to be comfortable, say if you invest in the Indian stock market right now, it's doing well, it's at a near top. You're going to have a lot of volatility through December to April, May, because elections. You have a fair chance that the market could crash if the electoral results are not what the market wants. Mm. On the other hand, if the market does crash, you'll have a wonderful opportunity in the sense that uh, the economic conditions will not necessarily get any worse. Can you stomach that risk? You can or you can't, but most people will not even ask themselves this question. They will go through shitting bricks in April and May if the market is swinging by large amounts. You need to ask yourself that question, how much money am I prepared to lose? before you actually get into a trade. Which comes to the other thing that this is my cutoff point. If I hit it, I will shrug and walk away. I, I'll cut my losses and walk away. It may be a it may be an error. You might look in the rearview mirror later and say that fuck I made a mistake. I should have hung in there. But if that is your if you have a pain point that you know this is where I will really start hurting. You need to have decided that before the before the situation arises. This is an easy known knowns and known unknowns sort of situation, but there are all sorts of I mean you need to ask this question every time you're getting into a transaction, whether it's long term or short term, that are you how much money are you prepared to lose? I'd once done an episode with our mutual friend Mohit Satyanand on investing in poker. He spoke about investing, I spoke about poker, the commonalities. And I have zero memory of the specific things that we spoke about there. But, you know, what is certainly 
true of poker is that a lot of really good players get completely screwed over because they haven't done bankroll management mm-hmm. that you absolutely have to know you know what amount of money or you know what's your stop loss how much are you investing risk is it worth growing. the risk yeah. and they just don't do that and also <laughs> you know the, all of those psychological things throwing good money after bad and you know the, 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 there's a saying about a particular poker player where they would say that what was the saying he shits like an elephant and eats like a mouse something like that the idea being that you know when uh, when you're losing you you lose a lot you drop a lot of money mm-hmm. when you're winning you quickly just want to you run know away. run away and all of that so all these kind of human cognitive tendencies mm, sort this of is true for rubber bridge players as well there are whole pile of them who on the days when they're playing badly will put a lot more in the way of money on the table and who will cut their winnings and run away when they are playing well or when they have a good thing happening so yeah and that that risk of ruin thing is i think is critically important because that is really something people don't think about and you see that is for a long term investor there are mm, there are other considerations involved perhaps you know that you know if you buy into a company like hindustan levers hindustan unilever you are never going to end up losing huge sums of money what you may not get is a return which beats inflation on a uh, long term basis that's more difficult to calculate i mean uh, as in it's an opportunity cost which you may not realize that this company has given me 4.5% annualized where inflation has actually been 6%. And just so you're just losing money a little slower than you would in a savings account basically. Yes. You're losing money but it's sort of draining slowly. Um that's more of if you're getting into you know some I I did this exercise about uh, three four months ago. Oh, I don't know whether this is okay, but I own both Paytm and NTPC. One is a utility which supplies you know fifty percent of India's power. It has very very predictable returns. The other is you know what it is. And both I had bought sequentially at what I thought were fairly low levels, and I made as it happens I made money on both. And I was checking at that point of time. NTPC had a return of about twenty percent. in a 12 month period ptm had a return of about 23 24% in that same period however ntpc at its worst when it got hit by a lot of people selling was down about 15% max the drawdown ptm's max drawdown was around 50% so you need to be capable of treating these two stocks differently even if you're holding them for long term in the hopes of long term returns that uh, fine i mean your chances of going bust in ntpc is almost zero you will at worst land up with a situation where you're not keeping in lactation hmm. your chance of going bust in paytm is pretty high but you might conceivably get a 3x or a 5x return if you bought it at the right moment so it's really how you think about variance that hmm. comes into yeah, play yeah variance yeah how you think about variance and volatility or call it what you will uh, see doing the analysis is not very difficult you're not i'm not using particularly fancy statistical tools or whatever i don't think it makes sense to try and fine tune this sort of operation beyond the point 
but you've got to ask yourself the questions and you've got to be prepared to look at the possibility that you could be wrong. That for a lot of people is very difficult. What has this journey revealed to you about character, about your character, about... I don't like working fixed hours. I don't like being given orders. I get bored very easily. And by and large, I've looked for ways in which I can support myself without having to worry about somebody else's opinion of me. I mean, if you're going to join General Electric GE and get to the top, you have to be worried about your boss and then the board and what have you's opinion of you. Uh, I would find that almost impossible to handle psychologically. Mm, I get bored easily. I, ages ago, I dated a shrink. And she was curious. So she made me take this test. Apparently, I have something. This is for Asperger. Apparently, it's, I think it's 50 markers, and I have 47 of them. Oh my God. I would not have put you down for that. Yeah, so, whatever, for whatever that is worth. Uh, so, I guess the uh, inability to interact with people on a long term basis, on a daily long term basis, is part of that particular thing. And uh, I can't read human beings brilliantly. I mean, I can't. I wouldn't even be able to tell on a daily basis whether my boss is pleased with me or not. You know, yeah. assuming I was in a boss uh, boys relationship. So, I've always tried to avoid being in those situations. Apart from that lack of ambition, I like being in high tension, dangerous situations, but I like knowing I have a bolt hole. Let me put it this way. I've been in Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. I've been in Sri Lanka while the IP IPKF thing was going out. And I grew up in Calcutta and Manipur at a time when things were absolutely crazy. So at a certain level, I'm very comfortable with those situations. And like is obviously the wrong word to use, but I'm comfortable handling those situations. But I like knowing that I have a bolt hole that I can get out of here and go somewhere and, you know, just chill out without having to worry about somebody shooting at me or whatever the case may be. Two of the urban legends about you are one, that you have been in prison in 13 countries or 14 <laughs> countries, and two, that you have played chess naked with Tukman Bashi. Uh, are, <laughs> is there any truth to any of these? Can you elaborate <laughs> no, if there is? Certainly not the second I've been in lockup in a lot of places, and I'd rather not elaborate on that. Uh, but how many places? It's... It depends on it depends on how you categorize the Soviet Union. Let let me put it mm. that way. But uh, I've been in lockup in a lot of places, in jail, as in. I haven't arrested. done time. I haven't done time. <laughs> no. Okay, how huh, unglamorous, but still, lockup is also uh, fun. A anything funky and interesting that you can reveal. Uh, having a translator who phrased, who started every uh, question being asked by the cops with, you are a citizen of a friendly, peace-loving, socialist republic. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
India. Hmm. <laughs> so I never thought of India being disco- described as a friendly, peace-loving socialist republic. And obviously the cops thought I was, you know, very high on something because he would say this and I would sort of crack up and then attempt <laughs> answer the question that followed that friendly peace loving de- democratic something socialist republic i mean he was quoting you know the constitutional india is a sovereign what have you with all, all the bells and whistles <laughs> uh, so that that was hilarious then um, what nothing really i mean um, random brawls here and there and you know being, random brawls being drunk being one time i wasn't arrested this is in bombay so it's not particularly yeah. the this guy charles sobraj he had escaped and he was floating around so that will place the yeah for you before zendi recaptured him <laughs> yeah and uh, I'd gone to visit a friend who uh, I was hoping to hop into bed with her, but she wasn't interested. Uh, so it was late at night and I had basically hit one of those um, CD hotels. And um, the cops raided it. I think, and I had told the, you know, the reception at the hotel, etc., that, no, I'm really interested in, you know, sleeping the next four hours. I'm not looking for any action or what have you. And they thought, okay, the man is crazy for, <laughs> but, I mean, eccentric, whatever, and given me a room. And sent a woman along, and I had said, you know no, thank sir. you but no thank you um, and then it was raided and so bang 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 at 3 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the morning and seeing what the fuck is going on kolo police etc etc so, they should have arrested you for being alone yeah <laughs> the guy on the desk was with the cops the cops were staring at me that he is actually alone and the guy was saying that mai bataya na ye akela hai everybody else along the corridor was random women in various stages of unrest and random men in various stages of unrest all trying to offer bribes bribes to anyone and me saying that you know like can I go go back to sleep the cops obviously thought i was the ultimate pervert <laughs> yeah yeah so you didn't get arrested no <laughs> I mean, what you're supposed to do <laughs> like, i would not have, i mean obviously i would not be prepared to pay money to get out of this situation there were many said jeez and such like who were very much more yeah and the thing that there was that you know the cops were they were seriously surprised <laughs> this was the first yes why would somebody be in this hotel and later i discovered that uh, they used sobraj as an excuse to raid every such joint in an extort yeah yeah One of my favorite quotes is by Annie Dillard where she says how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. And I want to ask you about that in terms of how has number one how has how you spend your days changed over the years to what you do now? And number two, what is a perfect day for you then? Because I guess I guess at this point we both you know kind of know the truth of this how we spend our days is how we spend our lives so it really does matter so what is that sort of ideal day for you and how has it changed over the years and i guess in a sense this is also a question about notions of happiness and how we want to live and what what we want and why we want it let me try and define it in terms of negatives i do not like housework i do not like being bored 
which leads to the fact that I like having a fair amount of reading material, an internet connection, and hopefully a few animals, cats as you know, around to take care of the boredom aspects. I don't I am not crazy about food, but I like good food. So, uh, good food is an interesting um, concept. And what else would I want? Not being under crazy work pressure, so able to structure my days so that if I want to take a break and play a few deals of bridge or play some blitz chess or whatever, I can do so. So those things would also check in on the loop. I like going for walks. I like, okay, this is a fetish. I like doing a workout, not a very heavy workout, but usually a workout with kettlebells while watching videos about maths. Why is it a fetish? Does it turn you on? <laughs> How can you call no. it a fetish? No, but, uh, you know, uh, most people seem to. Mm. I mean, consider this very weird. Uh, not the fact that I would work out, nor the fact that I would watch a maths video, but the fact that I would watch maths videos. I, I don't mean, I don't do maths in the sense of, you know, I'm not trying to pass an exam. So it's not like mm. IIT entrance exam, but some... Entertaining math video. Uh -huh, some math related video, which is... Or maybe a science-related video. Is it a case of neurons that fire together, wire together, that you have to do these two together? Like, can you work out without watching math videos? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I do watch without necessarily working out. Mm -hmm. Particularly pleasurable. Yeah, I find it particularly pleasurable. <laughs> so, yeah. I've been told that this is not normal. No, it's charming. Why is it not normal? I mean, whatever. Whatever gets... Yeah, yeah I mean... Yeah, so that... Uh, so I, you know, which again means the internet and uh, something which is mentally, let's say mentally engaging. Let me put it that way. And as it happens, I like a lot of science and maths videos. I find them more mentally en engaging than, you know, political stuff or what have you. So, yeah, I would also, uh, in this sense, I'm a strongly Indian guy. I would also watch a fair amount of music on YouTube. In fact, I would tend to have music playing in the background more or less the whole day. And uh, I would, yeah, I would, uh, and those would be my, my normal normals. Mm. Human beings don't seem to feature very heavily in this. That's what I'm wondering. I mean, there are people I know who would be quite upset with not being named to begin with. <laughs> yeah, I guess <laughs> solitude is, <laughs> is part of the... I mean, uh, I, I enjoy interacting with a lot of people, but it isn't... <laughs> It isn't uh, mandatory for me to enjoy my time. One of the most wonderful times in my life was many of the times I look back to with pleasure is when I've been on the road on my own. Mm. So I actively enjoy uh, my own company, for want of a better word. And... Uh, which can, of course, be a high-risk thing in the sense that 
you know, when you get into trouble, there isn't anyone to pull you out and the rest of it. But I do uh, spend a fair amount of time on my own. But my, I like my socialization, uh, socializing to be segmented. I like to not socialize for more than maybe two, three days days in a week and uh, I find it very difficult to handle um, you know the large party where you have to hang around oh, I, I don't know. I don't mind going to a large party saying hi hello and pushing away pushing off you know you know have one drink and wish whoever and push off that's fine but the large party where you have to hang around for a long period is can get very tedious. Uh, so I'm good with, as you know, with long one-on-one -on -one con conversations. I'm perfectly happy with. And what else would I see as enhancing? I like traveling without uh, being nuts about it. I like traveling and... I appreciate luxury when I can afford it. And, uh, I mean, without, uh, without being nuts about it. So, yeah, so good book, music, decent food, pets, a certain amount of physical activity. A certain amount of mental um, concentration or whatever. It's a good way to very, spend a day and it's a great way to spend a life. But you were saying? Uh, very few spam phone calls. <laughs> the fewer the spam phone calls, the better. That way, I, I'm a huge advocate for texting rather than calling. I cannot stand the whole thing of, you know, the the mad pointless phone call yeah well lucky you for having your own company which you said you enjoy so much and i'm really glad that uh, you spent so many hours with me i'll sort of end your ordeal uh in the studio with a like a final man you know question obligatory question i ask all my guests which is for me and my listeners recommend books films music that you absolutely love and you feel you know everyone should watch i mean you could start with whatever your favorite math video channels are or uh, the music you like to listen to all day but just apart from that any Thing that's meant something to you over your life mm, among recent reads i've been recommending this professor sarah hart she's she wrote a book called once upon a prime fairly recently which is the connections between maths and literature oh. so mm, things like Everything from people who have deliberately written mathematically constrained stuff, uh, as in not the letter, don't have the letter E kind of thing, as well as the obvious, the poems and uh, I mean the structure of E to people who used a fair amount of maths or math-based concepts in their uh, books. Which includes people like uh, Melville and Edgar Allan Poe, who did a lot of stories which involve cryptography, and uh, also the treatment of mathematicians in fiction. Moriarty, Professor Moriarty at one end, and uh, the curious incident of the dog, where you've got a Asperger's kind of uh, Asperger's kind of kid, yeah. And things like The Gentleman in Moscow where the time series of each event is is a Fibonacci uh, golden ratio sort of thing. So it's a very it's a delightfully written book as well as being fairly deep in its uh, conceptual thought processes so i thought it was charming in many ways 
books people should read mm. no no the stuff that you've loved I, the should area can take us into oh this is worthy and you must read it for your edification uh, not that but it's just stuff that you love mm. fantasy jemison she's extraordinarily good i would have recommended ursula le guin except that you know so mainstream that you don't even want to go there i mean she's brilliant she was utterly brilliant but uh, then among modern mm, mm, mm. a lot of my reading is unfortunately subjects which are so geeky that one hesitates to recommend no, 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 please do what it's about you whatever you love terribly difficult difficult question um recently reading and this is this couple to a documentary i watched on youtube i don't know whether it's there anymore I was re- recently reading Anthony Weaver on the Spanish Civil War, and there is this multi-part, or was this multi-part, documentary on the Spanish Civil War done by uh, Thames TV back in the eighties, which was quite extraordinary. I mean, I, I, again, this sort of thing. somebody puts it up on youtube then you have a complaint about copyright so it may have disappeared but would be well worth it uh i feel plebian this so mm, i really enjoyed uh the sandman adaptation first season that i saw on I can't even remember whether it was Amazon Prime or Netflix, but I really enjoyed it. Again, I, as graphic novels go, I thought that sequence, twelve books or fourteen books or whatever, is it's extraordinary. Mm. Michael Tyle's autobiography. which is hysterically funny at a lot of levels because he was obviously a crazy man i mean he has stories about uh, i don't know trying to pull a hippopotamus out of a working out a mathematical problem where he was trying to pull a hippopotamus out of a sna- uh, out of a swamp while actually playing in a f- critical game so he was he just seen this problem before he sat down to play it was one of those physics things that there's a 5 ton animal which is stuck in a swamp and you have a winch and a and gear and how will you pull it out so he was trying to work this out It's like what when he is thinking i'm making tall think and tall is thinking about hippopotamus <laughs> absolutely <laughs> then he realized he was short of time because of all this and he said that well i thought let it drown <laughs> <laughs> focused on playing the game in one and sure enough everybody said that you know he was in deep thought <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing so uh yeah so his autobiography is in itself quite extraordinary quite i mean it's entertaining in many ways mm Who else? What else do I like? Just um, what's the last film that made you cry? You don't cry. I cry, but not necessarily at the movies. The last couple of movies I watched, which I really liked, were both science fiction. Dune. I liked the first thing. I liked the uh, remake of. Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Ah, twenty forty nine. Extraordinary, extraordinary visuals. Mm, so, mm, cry no. Neither of them were cryable movies in that sense. But actually, if I thought about it, I would probably have come up with a less random set of choices. Mm. 
Random is good. Whatever comes into your head. Or you send me a list later. I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. Mm, I think uh, Srinath Raghavan's book on India in the Second World War, mm-hmm. India's War, which w- was, to my mind, uh, extraordinary because it shows you how India's global influence collapsed. after the british left and india started thinking of itself as a an asian country rather than the brits thinking of india as this arm um, this battleship which could control everything from the north african north west africa through to southeast asia I mean, first and second world war, Indian troops fought in you know every theater, practically speaking, including really bizarre ones. The Indians have actually fought on the same side as side as the Japanese against the Germans in the first world war, and this is in the Bismarck Sea in in the Pacific where a uh, joint indo-japanese expedition took over german possessions in that area so uh all the way from there to all of africa to um, italy to france um, to places like azerbaijan where you again you don't think about Indian soldiers having been involved there, and Iran, of course. So um, that and the drivers of that war, Srinath is a truly extraordinary writer and and thinker. So I, I mean, that is a book I would recommend. I would recommend anything written by him, but that is magisterial because I don't think anybody else has done a book with that sort of scope on that particular subject. If you had to write one book, what would you write it on? Hmm. not sure because i have i have too much of a uh, attention span problem perhaps i i would probably keep wanting to switch subjects i might end up writing several books one way or the other if i can sit down and think my way through them but the subjects would also vary I would love to do a book on corruption, for example, and I don't mean uh, specific incidents of corruption. Those would feature, of course, but uh, corruption as a way of life, as as something that drives empires, uh, if you get what I mean. And uh, that would be a subject worth writing on. I'd probably like to write a book at some stage about uh, um, people have professional mathematicians have done this kind of thing. How a mathematician looks at the world, which is not where I'm coming from. I'm saying that uh, the kind of joy you get. if you have a certain kind of mathematical mind or um, not necessarily a very deep one but something where uh, you see situations and you realize that they are amenable to uh, mathematical analysis if that makes sense actually everything is amenable to because the world is probabilistic so I yeah mean, of course but uh, you know that uh, you actually have a situation which can be abstracted for a mathematical analysis and particularly the ones 
uh, which are in apparently intractable like uh, you know the the game theoretic looks at things like uh, will north korea drop a bomb on south korea uh, is i mean i would not want north korea to drop a bomb on south korea i'm just saying that it's a kind of situation where it gives me a huge charge to realize that you can actually analyze this in mathematical terms right or wrong that you can actually look at this and say that yes or for example the you know i think reform in india the half completed was actually happened because for a while you had a coalition government which didn't know whether it would last uh, so it was looking at the value of the discretionary powers it had individuals in that government they were sort of saying that well okay the net present value of my discretionary powers since i'm not going to last 5 years works out to so much and then finding a way of getting that cash under the table while freeing up the sector concerned which is i suppose not the way in which it happened i'm pretty sure that none of the people involved actually did a net present value analysis in those terms but i suspect a very large proportion of reform in india has happened because of that because there is somebody insecure who thinks he or she will not be in a position of power tomorrow and is trying to cash in today in a smart way it's fascinating i mean i sometimes wonder about if you're in the finance ministry you could make so much money on the stock markets because you know in advance big announcements which are happening you do <laughs> i mean that is one of the things which uh i'm pretty sure has happened yeah has happened multiple times on that note dd thank you so much this has been an incredible uh, <laughs> day <laughs> so thanks so much If you enjoyed listening to this episode, check out the show notes and to rabbit holes at will. You can follow Devangshu Datta on Twitter at Devangshu Datta, and as Datta spelled with a D A, there's another Devangshu Datta with a D U. I'll link this from the show notes. In any case, you can follow me on Twitter at Amit Varma A M I T V A R M A. You can browse past episodes of the Seen and the Unseen at SeenUnseen dot i n. Thank you for listening. Did you enjoy this episode of the Seen and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to seenunseen.in/support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you.